water expedition to this island. And I still remember the first time, jumped over the side of the boat. And as soon as the bubbles cleared, I was surrounded by 15 gray reef sharks. After a couple minutes, the shark decided that we were boring and they went back to do their thing. And you look down, 90% of the seafloor is covered by thriving coral. And it's full of fish and a sea turtle comes by. Now this abundance that we rarely see anywhere except in well-managed marine reserves. This is what the ocean used to be like, and this is what we have learned from going to these pristine places. And you write in your book that you're writing the obituary of ocean life. What's the cure? The cure is doing less harm. Basically, there are three things that we are doing to the ocean. One is we are taking fish out of the water faster than they can reproduce. Two, we are turning the ocean warmer and more acidic because of man-made climate change. And three, we are throwing in everything that we don't want, our waste and our plastic. We need basically to reverse these trends. Does this mean that a lot of this falls to governments and their policies? That's a big part of it because it is governments that regulate fishing and mineral extraction and oil extraction. It is governments that have the legal authority to create large marine reserves in the ocean, but also... biodiversity, but also saving our life support system. We are not talking about something that is apart from us. We are not apart from nature. We are a part of nature. So these 10 years are probably the most critical in the history of humanity. The most accurate measurements of changing oceans will come from space. While Enric Sala explores what lies beneath, a new satellite is giving us data from above. We'll learn more about our oceans and climate change, but from space. A new satellite's been launched from California. Its mission, track the accelerating rise of sea levels. Well, the main instruments on board uh, include a dual-frequency radar altimeter. Um, this is the primary instrument of the mission, and that's the one that's measuring sea surface height, significant wave height, and wind speed over the ocean. And from those measurements, we can actually have the superb measurements that we expect um, of sea level rise. Data gathered from Sentinel-6 will be used alongside information from other satellites to build as complete a picture of the oceans as possible. With a, a, a long record, we can precisely uh, measure the acceleration. We eventually can detect new regime, tipping points. For example, if there is a runaway in the melting of uh, Greenland or Antarctica, sea level uh, will uh, record this uh, runaway change. 
because it is an integrator of all changes that are occurring in the, in the climate system. So we, we will be able to see some, some change, big change, in, uh, in the global climate. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration expects that sea level rise will increasingly threaten U.S. coastlines. One example, the southern tip of Manhattan is expected to flood 20 to 40 times a year by 2030. 11 uh, of the 15 largest megacities are located at the coast, and this number will double. In, um, I mean, the, the number of um, uh, people living in, in coastal area will double in, by uh, 2060. So, uh, it, knowing how much sea level is rising at the coast and how much it will rise in the future uh, in coastal areas is as uh, obvious. Uh, it, it's obviously a major goal uh, for for human being. Coming up, from sails to steam to oil, the shipping industry is no stranger to change. But how will it navigate the next transition? This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. Now for your roundup of this week's latest climate news, Jennifer Zabazaja has your Green in Brief. Here's the climate news you need to know. Deforestation of the world's largest rainforest has hit a 12-year high. More than 4,000 square miles of the Amazon rainforest was destroyed in 2020. That's a 9.5% increase from a year earlier. Government data shows that destruction has soared since President Jair Bolsonaro took office and weakened environmental enforcement. The Amazon is home to millions of species and plants and is critical in the fight against climate change. Bitcoin is hitting all-time highs, but at what cost to the environment? The cryptocurrency is energy intensive and there are concerns if it becomes mainstream. According to MIT, back in 2018, Bitcoin's carbon footprint was almost as big as Portugal's. Want to get better at tackling climate change? We'll hire more women. That's according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Firms with 30% or more women in top jobs tend to perform better when it comes to the environment and are more likely to set clear climate goals. Shopping online is more popular than ever now, but the price of convenience is measured in CO2, and more deliveries means more fuel burned and more packaging wasted. So what can companies do? Well, many are becoming more efficient and sourcing more clean energy for their data centers and warehouses. And England's farmers will be paid to go green after Brexit. As European subsidies are phased out, they'll get new money to encourage them to produce healthy, sustainable food. Poor farming practices are one of the leading drivers of water pollution and the loss of biodiversity. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in New York. 
Anne Marie, back to you. The shipping industry is more than just the grease on the wheels of globalization, it's its chief enabler. 11 billion tons of goods are transported by ship each year. The biggest contributors being 2 billion tons of oil, 1 billion tons of iron ore, and 350 million tons of grain. According to the International Chamber of Shipping, 80% of Europe's imports and exports happen over the seas. And for such a vast industry, it also contributes its fair share of emissions. Shipping makes up 12% of global transport energy consumption. So how does it clean up its act? Earlier, I caught up with Bloomberg Green reporter Laura Milan about just how big of a challenge this is going to be for the industry. One of the main issues is size. So um, about 90% of the world's cargo is moved by ships. So obviously changing such a huge uh, industry is not going to be fast and it's not going to be easy. The second issue is uh, has to do with technology. So uh, ships obviously uh, travel for many days at sea. It's not as easy for them to refuel as it would be for a car, for example, going on a road. And the sector still hasn't found a technology that's economically viable and that's uh, zero emissions and equivalent to, to the electric batteries for cars, for example. But actions are being put in place to make the industry a bit more environmentally friendly. Walk us through those steps that they're taking. That's it. So um, there's a, a first step that would involve uh, using low emission fuels or uh, biofuels that would significantly reduce the existing emissions. And then at a regulatory level, when it comes to the policy and the governments, there are steps being made as well. I would say that the most significant ones come from the European Union, which started to track emissions a few years ago and is now looking to include shipping emissions in the emissions trading system system. So that would significantly reduce and, and help calculate uh, the emissions from the shipping industry. Now, uh, China is taking similar steps. So at the moment, regions need to report shipping emissions to the central government. And finally, we have the International Maritime Organization with a pledge to reduce uh, shipping emissions by 50% in 2050. Now, we must say that that pledge uh, has been considered insufficient by environmental groups, but at least some steps are being taken. So to get to 2050, the industry obviously is going to need to start tapping some new technologies. What new technologies are you seeing being introduced into the shipping industry? So we have seen pilot technologies being developed for years now, but what's interesting about this current moment is that we're seeing big players invest uh, in these technologies that are not yet economically viable, but that one day might be. So for example, we are seeing uh, earlier this year, the world's largest agricultural commodities trader, Cargill, saying they will invest in attaching sails to their ships uh, so they can make any technology that they run their ships on more efficient. Similarly, we have seen a spin-off of Airbus, the aeronautics company, developing a similar application with kites. We have been following also developments in hydrogen. So at the moment, hydrogen fuel seems like a good option, a, a possible option when, when it has been uh, developed and when it becomes uh, economically viable. And we have Vestas, for example, the world's largest uh, turbine maker, developing some ships that will be able to run on hydrogen in the near future. Coming up, rising sea levels means humans need to get creative when it comes to coastal defenses. But how do we protect both ourselves and the environment? One Israeli startup may have the answer. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Green.
In London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. After water, what's the resource that humans use the most? It's concrete, three tons a year for every person on the planet. And engineers estimate it's used twice as much as all other building materials combined. And it comes with a huge environmental cost. Concrete, not just in cities, it's a common feature on our coastlines too. And that's taking a toll on biodiversity. But one Israeli startup has found a way of making sea defenses stronger and encouraging life to thrive. If you take a look at concrete structures like breakwaters or seawalls, the water around them is often clear. That's not actually a good thing because it means there's no life. Marine species are actually most abundant in coastal areas, but it's also where us humans prefer to live too. So when we build here, we drive away marine life. The concrete in the marine world has a lot of additives, a lot of chemicals, and some of those materials are actually leaching out and they're actually prohibiting marine life to thrive. We keep developing without any regards to natural communities. There is a tilting point uh, from which beyond we cannot really go back. coastal city of Tel Aviv, an Israeli startup wants to revolutionize our urban coastlines. Their sea defenses are transforming lifeless man-made structures into teeming ecosystems. They do this by replacing standard concrete with their own special cement formulas. As opposed to regular cement-based concrete, e-concrete includes certain elements uh, that enhance the growth of marine flora and fauna of plants and animals. Our admix, which is kind of our secret sauce, is basically kind of sealing the concrete, making it less aggressive for the marine environment. That once we add it, we enable life to flourish. In the lab, the team run tests to identify what mixes will work best for marine life. So we take really ice cube size concrete slabs of different compositions and we put larvae, 20, 30, 50. We need to have a lot of replicates. We're geeky scientists, so we have to have a lot of replication and controls. And then within a few days or just a few weeks, we can get an answer on uh, their preference. So obviously if they die, they have a very low tolerance to that specific concrete mix design. And if they thrive or they flourish, we can quantify that uh, very quickly. E-concrete says it typically sees double the biodiversity of regular grey concrete. From fish and sea caterpillars on their armour blocks to crabs on these tidal pools that sit on the shoreline. This unit holds water uh, during the low tide, so it's always moist. And therefore it has um, a very comfortable habitat for uh, crabs and sea anemones and sea stars, etc. These pools have been here for less than three months. And this is already what you can see. It's covered with life see the rock around it, which has been here for probably 10, 20, maybe even more years, only has a thin layer of green algae and that's it. As well as the composition of the cement mix, e-concrete designs its products specifically to the marine environment it will be deployed, to create niches for endangered species, or to develop nurseries like these oyster beds. The final part of the equation is creating complex surface textures to mimic natural rock or coral an environment that helps anchor young organisms. When concrete elements are being cast, the typical goal is to have a very slick uh, surface, very, very smooth. The idea is to get the water to flow right across it. When we're designing e-concrete with a rough surface, we want to do the complete opposite. We want to slow the water when they are crossing the structure so that the larvae can actually adhere uh, and attach to the surface. Concrete has to offer its clients more than just ecological credentials. Over time, they've discovered that creating hospitable habitats for marine life adds another advantage, one that is surely hard to ignore. We've seen evidence to the fact that the growth of the organisms on the concrete create kind of a layer of defense. Just the addition of weight, we can actually gain stability and strength over time. This is the, let's say, the, the unit when we put it in the water. And this is after a year in the water. And what you can see here is all the oysters are completely covering it. We designed the units so they can withstand the forces and perform in terms of structural performance, but they can also be 
a backbone for uh, ecological enhancement. The company tests its miniature designs in tanks full of real seawater, rocks, plants, and animal life from around the world. What we're looking for is the accumulation of calcium carbonate on the surface of the concrete of, by, of different mixes and different designs. This is the process that we call it biogenic buildup. So with time, we get a buildup of calcium carbonate that is sourced from marine organisms on the surface of the concrete. And we actually encapsulate the concrete with a natural rock. So when the organism die, in the case of a coral, it will die, and then another coral will sit on it, and that's how a reef is growing. The hope that our man-made structures could become stronger over time also means better economics. The units require less maintenance and could therefore stay in the water for longer. E-concrete, though, is just a few years old, so it needs more time to really quantify the longevity of its products. But the company are certain their products are better for the environment, and not just in terms of improving biodiversity. We're kind of trying to offset some of that immense carbon footprint of the concrete industry. Construction is responsible for about 11% of global carbon emissions. By adding a biological crust to their products, e-concrete prevents some CO2 from being released into the atmosphere. For every kilogram of uh, calcium carbonate being created by those marine organisms, we're offsetting 120 grams of CO2. So think about building a port infrastructure or a city waterfront that is an active carbon sink. I think that's a great advantage to the technology. That does it for this week, but let's keep the conversation going on Twitter. Follow us at Climate. I'm Anne Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. Yes, indeed, everyone. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio, streaming on YouTube. It is Wednesday, January 6, 2021. Uh, there's just a few things going on. <laughs> Uh, to say the least, yeah. uh, and so much of it out of the nation's capital. Yes, yeah, so much of it out of the nation's capital. Look, obviously the biggest story happening in the last 24 hours is Democrats looking like they are going to sweep in Georgia. I will tell you that I did not see that coming, Carol. I no. told you that yesterday. That was a surprise Although to my, me. Well, yeah, and I think some people, right, exactly. We were talking about, like, we just weren't sure yeah. what the outcome would be. Uh, and then also the Federal Reserve. 
We're watching the Federal Reserve. Well, we've got the FOMC minutes. They are due uh, out any moment. As we know, it's always a little bit of a process to get them out uh, because they're not pre-released. So as soon as they do cross, uh, they're just coming across. We will bring them to you. Quick check on the Treasury trade ahead of that. We've got that 10-year note above 1%, another one of our big stories today, 104. But we'll bring you some of those headlines in just a moment. First up, though, let's get to your top business stories. Check on that trading day. Here is Charlie Pellet. Hi, thank you very much. A lot going on on this Wednesday, and I do want to begin with an additional headline out of Washington, D.C. The Justice Department says 3% of its email accounts could be compromised in a hack. It says classified systems not likely affected. In New York, Governor Cuomo announcing a proposal to legalize cannabis. Marijuana stocks surging today. Tilray among some of the names uh, that are seeing a big move today, up by 24%. And in the airline industry, Canada says it will allow flights from the U.K. to resume. Steelmakers, machinery producers surging on speculation that Democrats will take control of Congress, paving the way for President-elect Joe Biden to pass a wide-ranging infrastructure stimulus bill. Equities surging at or near session highs right now. We've got the S&P up 52 at 37.79, up 1.4 percent. NASDAQ up 77, higher by six-tenths of one percent. The Dow is up 590, up by 1.9 percent. Tenure down 27.30 seconds, the 10-year yield 1.04 percent. Gold is down 2 percent, lower by $38 the ounce at 1911. And West Texas Intermediate Crude back above 50 at 50.83, up today by 1.8 percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Got it, Charlie. A few Fed headlines crossing. A couple of Fed officials open to lengthening bond maturities. Uh, eventual tampering could be similar to 2013-2014. So we're talking about the Fed rolling back on some of its uh, stimulus efforts that we have seen so far. Just a reminder, these are those Fed minutes from the December 15-16 FOMC uh, meeting. We're going to dig into that, Tim, in just a moment. Fe focus on the Fed, though. It is brought to you by Commonwealth, supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business. Commonwealth, go where you grow. Visit Commonwealth.com to learn more. All right, let's learn more about the Fed minutes and just kind of the world in general because there's a lot going on. Kathleen Hayes is with us, Global Economics and Policy Editor at Bloomberg News. She's on the phone in New York. Dave Wilson, stocks editor at Bloomberg News on the remote access from New Jersey. Kathleen, let's just get right to it. The headlines, a few of them are out. What do we need to know, especially on a day where I feel like the talk this morning was all about that 10-year hitting and going above 1%. Well, you know, this is certainly something that I think it's interesting. The question and the argument is going to change very quickly, and I'm really glad to have this news out ahead of my interview, exclusive interview with the Chicago, excuse me, the uh, Cleveland Fed president, Loretta Mester, because the debate right. has been tapering. Loretta Mester said in a speech this week, oh, we're not going to taper, and people, you know, stop buying as many bonds as we've been buying. I think now the question for Loretta and other Fed officials will be, gee, if you see the yields moving above 1.04%, is it time maybe to buy more bonds to prevent them from going too high? I think, and of course, uh, the, uh, the question for them is, if the tenure is rising because investors see reflation, particularly with the quote-unquote blue wave and the possibility of more stimulus that will help the economy more than expected, right. maybe boost inflation, would you want to then feel you have to keep the tenure at or below 1%. Or you would say, look, it's going to be a natural occurrence. Will the Fed just say they're going to, you know, sit and watch? But it's a very interesting situation. I think one more thing about these minutes today. Yep. Because they were, the Fed met when the virus resurgence wasn't as bad as it is now. That's one thing. We saw that weak ADP report today. It looks like maybe that is starting to hit hiring, right? Mm -hmm. And furthermore, uh, nobody was at all convinced that the G Georgia runoff would end with uh, the uh, Democrats winning p probably both races. Right. So I think we take this all with a grain of salt. Right. Uh, good point, uh, Kathleen. And I just want to remind to, uh, everybody that in terms of that Treasury trade, doesn't look like we've seen much movement uh, along the yield curve. Uh, Ten-year note with the yield of 1.04, year note with the yield of 0.43, and the two-year note with the yield of one point. Uh, uh, 0 0.14, excuse me. Dave Wilson, come on in on the equity trade because it too, we've seen a rally and we're kind of holding on to those highs of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Not much of a reaction no. to uh, the release. No question that 
it's a day where really banks are at the forefront, which is telling you something perhaps about what people are anticipating for the economy and for Fed policy going forward. Now, you look at the biggest U.S. banks, you see Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo all up about 7.5%, and you've got even bigger gains in the regional banks. Uh, beyond that, you, you can see there's a real shift toward companies that uh, tend to benefit when the economy picks up. I mean, we saw that to some extent in the fourth quarter, and it's really reasserting itself today. Uh, beyond the financial stocks, it's raw material producers, it's industrial companies. You know, to some extent, it's that consumer discretionary category, retailers, automakers, home builders, and so on, uh, though Amazon.com is weighing on that group a bit because of its dominant role within retailing. Uh, and, you know, the big tech companies have been off a bit, though they've rebounded from their lows of the day. So, you know, you put it all together and you can see that, you know, optimism is is building here. And to some extent, you, you can tie it back to uh, what happened down in Georgia. OK, well, I'm so glad you said that because that's kind of confusing to me because for the last few weeks and really two months, Dave, we've been hearing just about how gridlock is good, how a divided Congress is good. That's what investors were expecting. Um, why are we seeing stocks move higher when now Democrats are going to control all three? Well, you aren't much beyond gridlock with a 50-50 split in the Senate and the vice president-elect uh, Kamala Harris having to come in and break ties on a regular basis potentially. So, you know, that may well be part of it. Beyond that, I mean, it's just the idea that you're going to get more potentially in terms of economic stimulus. I mean, the issue of the $2,000 checks for every American, uh, you know, it came up in the Georgia Senate runoff for sure. Yeah. So you have that to look forward right. to. You also you have what's going on with bonds. You also have some Democrats, whether it's a Joe Manchin and some others, who tend to lean right. So it, like they'll have to con Biden and, and Democrats will have to convince them Correct. that it says to say, hey, this is a good thing. The other thing I'll point out is, and I was hearing a lot of coverage, is that you know, an Obama administration, he you know had control of the Congress uh, coming in after the financial crisis. You know, it turned out to be pretty good for markets. And I do think, Dave, don't you think it's safe to say that investors? You know, understand that we're probably going to have an administration, though, that is going to try to do things that are ultimately good for the economy. Yeah, sure. And then there's no doubt it's part of it. I mean, you consider, you know, some of the groups that are moving beyond the banks in response to uh, what's happened in Georgia. Right. Renewable energy, certainly that's been a focus for Biden. Uh, construction materials, uh, metals, yeah, yeah. also higher. You know, they get infrastructure spending cannabis companies because of the potential for changes in policy right, right. on that front. Hey, so lots hey, of areas moving. I'm cutting you off because I want to get Kathleen in just real quickly. Reflation, Kathleen, it's not bad. I mean, we want to see economic growth come back. I mean, that in fact is on your side, Carol. You know, yeah. that they move to uh, an average inflation targeting policy where they are they're looking mm -hmm. for inflation to go above 2% and stay there for a while. You can, you can go back and forth about, oh, the Democrats can be more and less stimulative, but there's no doubt out, that there's, I would see in most people's mind, there is going to be more stimulus, what it means for the Federal Reserve, what it means for the bond market. It isn't so much this or that. I think it's just that, okay, now that is pretty much baked in the cake. You'll probably get $2,000 stimulus checks now. There may be a, sti a second stimulus package that there might not have been otherwise. But let's remember, too, there is a camp in the bond market, quote, unquote, worrying or certainly focused on rising inflation and wondering what it is going to mean for investors. Again, a healthy economy yeah. pushes yields higher. Right. So is that a bad thing? Got it. How does the Fed respond to that? Do they say, oh, better buy more bonds to keep yields down? Or do they say, you know, we're getting what we tried to get with exactly. all this stimulus? But that's going to be another... Uh, potentially yeah. difficult landmark uh, moment for bond investors and therefore for the stocks as that plays out. And we're still not at 2%, which is when people maybe start to get a little hinky. All right, Kathleen Hayes, Dave Wilson, thank you so much. Let's get a check on World of National News. Over to Ann Cates in D.C. Hey, Ann. The joint session to count electoral college votes continues on Capitol Hill. Some Republicans loyal to President Trump are contesting the results, starting with the state of Arizona. It will not change the outcome of declaring Joe Biden the winner, but the move is likely to spark hours of debate and allow for the session to drag on. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has criticized lawmakers for challenging the outcome. President Trump, meanwhile, has told supporters in Washington that he will never concede the outcome of the 2020 election. Hundreds of Proud Boy members and other groups have gathered in D.C. to protest with
what the president calls rigged results. President-elect Joe Biden has selected Merrick Garland, a federal appeals court judge, who in 2016 was snubbed by Republicans for a seat on the Supreme Court as his attorney general. According to Bloomberg, Biden is expected to announce Garland's appointment tomorrow, along with other senior leaders of the Justice Department. The U.S. continues to battle a spike in COVID-19 cases. The number of confirmed coronavirus infections has hit 21 million, and the death toll in the U.S. has topped 358,000. The European Union, meanwhile, has approved use of the Moderna vaccine, and British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, meanwhile, says his government will use every tool possible to help protect the elderly. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ann Cates. This is Bloomberg. All right, Anne, thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business. We Carol Master along with Tim Stenovec. We want to bring in our Steve Dennis. He's Bloomberg News Senate reporter. He's on the phone from Maryland. You know, we've seen that with a lot of news coverage that folks are staying out of the nation's capital because of concerns about rioting and protests. And so that's what we've seen. Seems Tim. like a very good move given yeah. the early in, early reports that we're seeing right now coming from our nation's capital. Yeah, and we're watching some of that footage. We'll bring you any headlines as they are known. In the meantime, you and I, and if you go to our YouTube channel, search Bloomberg uh, Global News, you will see some of the protests uh, right there and people gathering right there uh, on the steps of the Capitol. So uh, obviously being kept off because of uh, police, but there are definitely clashes. Steve Dennis, come on in on uh, Tim and I were kind of riveted. We had our call at 1.30 and we're like, we want to get off the call because we want to get back to listening to Mitch McConnell, to Chuck Schumer, to listening to what is going on in the Senate floor. It is, no doubt about it, a day for the history books. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, we all know how this movie ends, which is... <laughs> which is the what they were Senate. saying, right? Yeah, I mean, the House and the Senate are not going to overturn this election, neither chamber. It's not going to be close. It's going to be fairly overwhelming, you know, potentially 80-some votes in the Senate to confirm Biden's victory and uh, probably less overwhelming in the House, um, a lot of House Republicans are a little bit more Trumpy, uh, as it were. But, you know, Mitch McConnell's speech there was kind of an extraordinary speech. Agreed. From, from the, the, the top Republican in, in the country, basically, right now, excoriating Trump's efforts to overturn the election and his allies in Congress for challenging the electors. He basically said that there's been no evidence of widespread fraud um, that they've the courts have spoken that the state legislatures have spoken the people have spoken and it's not the job of congress to intervene and and prevent that from happening and he and he basically called them out and said let you know this is uh, you know that your duty as a patriot call them out on patriotism is is uh, is to accept not just victories but defeats. Mm -hmm. you know, that that's how a republic endures. And he basically it's said what we that, teach our kids, right? You're going to lose sometimes. You got to accept it. Yeah, and he and he basically said, look, these aren't protest votes. You know, where you just hope somebody else is going to going to vote the other way, so that it doesn't matter. You know that these are going to reverberate, and 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 you are damaging the republic by doing this. And and so. You know, it's not very often that you see Mitch McConnell up there basically torching his own um, members of his own party and his own caucus. How, how, does it, how is this going to look when, when we look back on and write the, the history of the Republican Party in, in 2020 and 2021? Is this, is this a, are you seeing a, a divergence here? Are you seeing a split between the party of Mitch McConnell and the party of Ted Cruz? Yeah, I mean, we're kind of back to the future. I kind of feel like we're back to 2010, 2011. Where when it was the was Tea Party. This, yeah, where there was this split between the, the Cruz wing and and the McConnell wing. And the McConnell wing is, is the establishment. It's been the majority of the party in, uh, on Capitol Hill for, for the whole time. Um, but there's been this sort of uneasy truce, uh, marriage of convenience between the Trump populists and the establishment McConnell types. And, you know, with Trump's loss here, this 
and especially what happened in Georgia. Hey, Steve, that, I just want to mention fight is coming back uh, with a vengeance. Steve, I just want to mention there are uh, footage we're watching. Uh, protesters have apparently breached the scaffolding outside the Capitol. Um, so, which explains why you know uh, the Capitol definitely was you know making sure that there weren't too many people there. Um, but it is pretty staggering to see these protests uh, and really just kind of barreling down on the doors of the Capitol. Yeah, and I, th I think it's important to remember here the president himself, right? The president mm -hmm. who has, has tweeted terms like law and order, the president who's talked about peaceful protests, the president who today had this rally where he just repeated unsubstantiated claims that he's been right. saying over and over again has has really riled up a lot of this of, of his base and and it seems like he's essentially put in his blessing for for them to act yeah i mean uh it's just you know unprecedented certainly in my experience to have uh, a president saying uh all of these things and ha you know urging people to show up um i think rudy giuliani talked about Let's settle this in combat. In his speech today, that's a little concerning. Um, and you have some reports of some violence and some uh, some evacuations on the Hill. The Cannon House office building, it's the biggest house office building, was evacuated. Um, there's lots of reports of clashes and people trying to push into the buildings. Very, very uh, concerning things for folks uh, who are on the Hill. And, you know, uh, there are lots and lots of Capitol Hill police. I think they have like 1,800, 1,900 Capitol Hill police. But still, it's a, it's a worrisome situation because anybody can basically walk up to the campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, hopefully there won't be any ser serious violence. Well, and what's interesting, and we are for our Utah, YouTube audience who are watching Bloomberg Business Week uh, right now, you can see the protests, you can see uh, live shots of what is going on uh, right there at the Capitol specifically. You know, what does it mean, though, Steve? And this is, I think, you know, conversations we've certainly had in and around the newsroom that, you know, we obviously have a clear winner when it comes to the president and the vice president, but you still have a nation um, where it was close and a lot of Americans who support President Trump. You also, as Senator Ted Cruz said, you know, he goes, what is it when you've got nearly half the country that believes the election was rigged? I mean, we heard that in the Georgia election yesterday where people who were going to the polls saying, well, I, I think the election was rigged. Like, So what does it say about what's going on in this country, whether it's disinformation? What is it right now? And what does that say kind of about the broader public and their views on our political system? Uh, I, I think that there's, you know, it's, it's, we now basically have a split re war in the Republican Party. Um, by the way, I am watching Senate floor. Yeah. And Mike Pence was just sort of hustled out of the chamber, and the Senate is in recess. So, you know, normally there's supposed to be two hours of debate. Right now, I'm looking at the uh, Senate floor. They had a one of the police officers at the rostrum. So this is this is not what normally happens in the U.S. Senate. Um, so we're, we're going to try and figure out exactly yeah. what's going on there and whether it has to do with some of the protests that are happening outside the building. So what is what is typical procedure here? I mean, this is not something that we as, as observers, we normally right? watch, right? We normally watch every four years, right? This is something that is only getting attention because of the way that the president has talked about misinformation when it comes to the election and the way the president has complained about the election and the way that uh, Republicans now increasingly, uh, members of Congress, have said that they are going to challenge these results. What is what What happens here over the next 12, 24 hours? Yeah, I think, you know, each of these states that are going to be challenged, there could be three or as many as six, it's going to take at least two or three hours. They get two hours of debate, then they have to vote, then they have to reconvene. They've got a, a special pandemic precautions. So it, 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 this thing could go all night and into tomorrow. It really depends on these Republicans and how many states they want to challenge when it starts to look futile. Yeah, because um, they're going to lose all these, and they're going to lose them badly. And it's so, sort of a question of how much do they want to anger their fellow senators? Um,
especially with all the chaos that's happening outside the building. Yeah, and I just want to point out, I'm just looking at some of the cable coverage that's going on, and, and forgive me, So, uh, but they're talking about the RNC headquarters being evacuated. Uh, we've got a headline, too. All U.S. Capitol buildings are going into lockdown due to the current protests. And uh, Steve uh, Dennis, our Steve Dennis, was just saying that it looked like uh, Vice President Mike Pence was taken from the Senate floor. Let's bring in our Kevin Cirilli. He's Bloomberg News Chief Washington Correspondent, host of Sound On on 991 uh, in uh, D.C., and he's there from our D.C. studio. Kevin, we knew it was going to be a crazy day, but I think uh, it certainly feels a lot more... Uh, a lot more tensions are, are picking up uh, as we go uh, minute by minute here. Well, well Carol, I want to commend you and Tim and, and our Stephen Dennis for, for excellent reporting as we stick to what we know right. and, and, and stay stoic about this and, and report on the facts. And here's what we know. All U.S. Capitol buildings have gone into lockdown due to the protests. We should also note that staffers, based upon some of my reporting, have received, as is a procedure, uh, emails uh, alerting them that they cannot get on to the Capitol compound campus. Now, Tim, I know you know this from your years in reporting in Washington, D.C., but I'll point this out. Uh, there is, it is somewhat, there is a system and a procedure in place that is being followed. The Capitol Police are uh, incredibly, incredibly uh, disciplined in terms of how they guard and protect the Capitol compound and the hundreds of staffers uh, that are working there, commuting in and out of there uh, every single day. We should also note, given the pandemic, that the attendance of staffs for the various Capitol compounds has dramatically declined and that tourists have not been attending. So the, the Capitol Police are used to a uh, high frequency number of individuals on its compound at any given point. And while the compound is intersected between public locations as well as more blocked off locations and high security facilities, there are channels and procedures in place for that. Based upon what I've seen in downtown Washington, D.C., uh, this is a city that has been bracing for today for several days now. Uh, there have been, I would say, based upon the, the protests that have happened uh, over the uh, uh, last couple of months here in the nation's capital, not nearly as many protesters that we've witnessed over the past couple of months. That said, there is an intensity uh, to this day that is palpable amongst the small businesses in downtown Washington, D.C., several of whom have boarded up their windows. Uh, but again, to reiterate uh, that the, the Capitol compound has gone into lockdown, uh, this is is something that occurs not frequently. However, it has occurred uh, several times over my decade here in Washington, D.C. Yeah, let's just recap uh, what is going on. Congress, as Kevin was just telling us, forced to recess from the vote certification process. Uh, all U.S. Capitol buildings have now gone into lockdown. And Vice President Mike Pence was escorted out of the Senate chamber. Uh, that is what we know. Is that you, Steve, in the background? Yes, I, I think it was actually Grassley. Oh, gra um, I went back and looked at the. I went back and looked at the video feed. It looks there was a bunch of uh, police who came by, and it looked like they grabbed grassley yeah. however there's also you know pence may have also been taken yeah. out yeah I'm, I'm looking at our live feed and it i'm looks seeing like that pence was in our live feed that vice president yeah. pence was also escorted out of the the senate chamber um it looks like it's now in lockdown where they're not letting senators in or out of the chamber um you could see on the feed that uh, staffers and senators are sort of milling about looking at their phones trying to figure out what what's going on so I have a question for you, and I do want to be careful, as Kevin said, and Kevin, maybe everybody can weigh in, because there's lots of stuff certainly flying around on Twitter right now. Um, are still protesters, as much as we know, still outside of the Capitol building, or do we know uh, if, if whether or not they've made any further progress? There are 
uh, uh, protesters outside of the uh, uh, on the Capitol compound outside. Okay, and 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 we should note that there typically is a procedure. Uh, for protesters who wish to stage some type of protest or lockdown inside of the Capitol uh, compound. And uh, that clearly has not been followed. Otherwise, there would not be a lockdown. Okay, understood. So right now we're seeing also that the U.S. presidential certification has been put on hold as Congress has been forced to recess from the vote certification process we can't see the future, of course, but what does it mean for the timing of, of when this will officially get done? Uh, Kevin, start with you. Well, I do, we do have some breaking news that has just crossed the Bloomberg terminal. President Trump has tweeted, quote, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to wow. protect our country and our Constitution, giving states a chance to certify a corrected set of facts, not the fraudulent or inaccurate ones, which they were asked to previously certify. U.S. demands the truth, exclamation point. Again, that's the president well, of the United States tweeting. Kevin, you know, just before the vote certification process started, Mike Pence released a lengthy statement talking about what he was planning on doing and essentially saying he was powerless in this process, right? The, according to his statement, he was citing the 12th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which states that the, the president of the Senate, in this case, Vice President Mike Pence, has to count the votes uh, of the certification process. But we should note just how unprecedented it is for a sitting president of the United States to openly criticize his own vice president. Uh, this is, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, just to describe some of the images uh, I, we're watching about uh, a, uh, uh, where protesters have now taken to the steps of the Capitol on the, on the front-facing side. So mm -hmm. if you're if you're familiar with the Capitol, the side of the Capitol that faces uh, the uh, Lincoln Memorial on the National Mall. All right. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, along with Tim Stenovic, we want to thank our Steve Dennis, who's been watching, of course, uh, the Senate floor and also all of the uh, news out of D.C. Kevin Cerulli is going to stay with us also, just keeping us up to speed on the latest, as we are seeing, just again, a reminder of some of the headlines. The U.S. House and Senate chambers have gone into recess as all U.S. Capitol buildings go into lockdown due to the protests. So the move forcing those lawmakers to halt uh, that vote certification process. Again, we saw headlines that Mike Pence was escorted from the chambers and others as well. And Kevin, of course, mentioning that the president uh, is tweeting at this point and being critical of his own vice president in terms of this process. Yeah, uh, Donald Trump, President Trump writing on Twitter just now, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what he should have been, what should have been done to protect our country and our constitution, giving states a chance to certify a corrected set of facts, not the fraudulent or inaccurate ones which they were asked to previously certify. USA demands the truth. This coming just after the president wrapped up his comments mm -hmm. uh, to a, a large crowd of people who had gathered in the Capitol today, as the uh, members of as members of Congress do vote to certify the presidential election, which, as you mentioned, Carol, has been put on hold. Yeah, exactly. The president earlier saying that he will never concede in terms of the elections. A couple of things I just want to point out for everyone that I am watching, Tim is watching, our whole team is watching our live blog. MSNBC is reporting that there are protesters now inside the Capitol building. I just want to source it, uh, but we have been watching all. Also, uh, some various reports on Twitter about maybe being uh, seeing some of those protesters inside the Capitol building. The U.S. House is now said to be back in session. That is coming from our own Tal Barak Harif. Uh, if I look at the equity markets, we have turned off our highs of the session. In fact, the Nasdaq has gone negative. It is now down about eight points. Dow still a one and a half percent rally, but again turning the corner and taking a leg down. The S&P 500 still up about 33 points, but again. Uh, so Certainly, I would safe to say that what is going on in Washington right now is certainly creating another round of uncertainty, and that is playing out in the financial market. Yeah, it certainly is. Do we still have Kevin with us to, to go back to Kevin? Uh, so really, I know he's keeping a close eye uh, right now on everything that's happening in the Capitol, where he is in Do we Washington, D.C. Yeah. Um, Kevin, I want to check back in with you to see. Uh, I know we've spent the last couple of minutes going over some headlines. What else have you been learning? What we know right now is that there are... I, I, I'm hesitant to use an estimate, but the, the front-facing steps of the United States Capitol uh, is where uh, dozens uh, of protesters are standing. 
uh, and that is obviously very atypical. The Capitol compound has gone into lockdown, uh, and our reporters on Bloomberg's Congress team are reporting that uh, many senators who were on the United States Senate chamber have, are, are locked down in there as well. Uh, th I, I would note, again, based upon the procedures that the United States Capitol Police have in place, that they are following strict adherence to protocol uh, for these types of lockdowns. There are several main staircases outside staircases of the United States Capitol. Only one of them is filled with protesters. The other is about, uh, I would say, 25 percent full. Uh, I want to be incredibly, incredibly factual here. There have been no reports of violence at this time. Right. There have been no reports of injuries at this time. And there is a, a, a palpable sense of intensity uh, to the story that we are covering uh, just within the last couple of hours, hearing from the President of the United States, the Senate Majority Leader on the Senate floor, the Minority Leader, uh, Senator Ted Cruz, uh, as well as uh, top government officials all convened in a joint session of Congress. Various, again, uh, there are multiple reports coming from uh, many members of uh, media across different networks. So as Kevin has been reminding us, as we've all been reminding you, we're being very careful about some of the headlines. But I do want to point out, and this is coming also from our live blog that is tracking what is going on in Washington, uh, CNN reporting uh, U.S. Capitol Police are asking for additional law enforcement for assistance, including federal authorities per a source familiar. Um, the National Guard has been requested at the Capitol. Sources are telling uh, other reporters here. So I'm just watching some. This is from Politico specifically. And then I'm just looking at a reporter over at CBS saying that there are police in the chamber. We have been locked in. So, uh, And I think there was another report that said that, indeed, that there's been some break uh, into uh, the Capitol. Well, let's go from the Capitol to the White House now, where White House reporter for Bloomberg News, Justin Stink, Stink, Sink, excuse me, Justin, is standing by. Uh, Justin, what are you seeing at the White House right now? I think things here are a little bit calmer, obviously, earlier this uh, this morning, the president addressed a lot of these demonstrators at the White House, uh, kind of laid out some of these demonstrators at the White House, uh, kind of laid out some of his grievances and, and concerns with the election, and then encouraged them to go to the Capitol building. So mm -hmm. um, the White House has not commented on um, what we've seen up on Capitol Hill and develop over the last hour, which is folks that, that seem to have broken in and some of the lockdowns that we've had going. The president himself uh, tweeted a couple minutes ago to sort of admonish Vice President Mike Pence for not um, taking up his suggestion to try to send the election results back to the state. The vice president said that he didn't think he could constitutionally do that. Uh, so he's certainly uh, monitoring what's going on, but we, we haven't heard anything specifically about the protesters Just entering the Capitol. Yeah. Justin, is this the moment for you that that Mike Pence and Vice President Pence and, and President Trump diverged? I mean, that tweet, that's a big deal, right? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because <laughs> uh, throughout the last four years of covering the Trump White House, you kind of wait for the shoe to drop with each loyalist to President Trump when they are faced with a, a situation where they have to break with the president. And time and again, he has sort of proven willing to... Uh, throw them under the bus if, if they aren't uh, up for doing what he wants. And, and Mike Pence had been the one person who had been sort of able to escape that fate, able to, uh, you know, walk the tightrope between what the president wanted and what sort of establishment Republicans expected of him. And, and that uh, is no longer true. And so the real question, I think, is what the political ramifications are for the vice president down the road. If he wants to run himself, will he be able to do it on the mantle of being Donald Trump's vice president? And if President Trump decides to run again in four years, will he still want Mike Pence on the ticket? Yeah, exactly. Um, Jennifer Epstein covers also the White House for us here at Bloomberg News, says uh, President-elect Joe Biden arriving uh, at the Queen in Wilmington, where he'll be speaking shortly. 
Uh, so we are expecting some comments from the president-elect, so we will continue to monitor that as well. Justin, uh, you said things are pretty calm over at the White House. I do wonder, though, about the president beyond, you know, his team, um, how they might be seeing what's going on in the nation's capital. Does he still have support within his inner circle in terms of some of, um, you know, his refusal to accept the the outcome of the election? I'm just curious what else you're hearing about what's going on inside the White House right now. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, obviously I think the president has a number of aides who are extremely loyal to him and, and who themselves have sort of backed and encouraged uh, some of uh, his efforts to contest the election. We know Mark Meadows was on that call over the weekend with Georgia um, state officials mm -hmm. trying to, to, to pressure them. Uh, at the same time, I mean, this is going to be a situation that's, that's going to be a little tricky for somebody like Kayleigh McEnany, the press secretary at the White House, who spent all summer denouncing protesters, denouncing clashes between protesters and police in uh, cities across the country, including in Washington, D.C., during um, uh, some of the demonstrations against uh, police killings of, of African-American men. And, and so, you know, there's a real question for them about whether or why they have not yet condemned what's going on, uh, on up on Capitol Hill. Don, Donald Trump Jr., the, the president's son, has issued a tweet that uh, asks protesters not to engage in some of the things that we've seen so far. And so mm. that's an indication that at least some in the in the president's inner circle are a little concerned about how far things have escalated. Yeah, that's certainly a, a notab notable development. Justin, stand by. I want to bring in Jack Fitzpatrick, who's congressional reporter for Bloomberg government, who joins us now on the phone from D.C. Uh, Jack, we're just learning now that Washington, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, Bowser has uh, ordered a citywide curfew starting at 6 p.m. tonight. What are you seeing? Uh, well, what we're seeing is a, a lot more chaos than a 6 p.m. curfew can probably manage because right now uh, we've got a couple of colleagues, Eric Wasson and Billy House, who are in the Capitol which has been overrun by protesters who are currently in the Capitol, uh, which has disrupted the proceedings on, on the certification of the election. Uh, and now they, they've got lawmakers uh, sort of, I don't know if trapped is the right word, but staying inside the chamber, uh, preparing possibly to have to evacuate the chamber. There, there is clearly essentially an emergency in the Capitol right now uh, and it appears to be up to the Capitol Police to try to uh, put this down uh, and is probably well beyond what the mayor can do with a curfew. I just want to point out a couple of our uh, team members from uh, Washington, Anna Edgerton, said the crowd wouldn't let the police cars through to reach the Capitol. Um, and she and Josh Wingrove also saying protesters are blocking the police as all also. So uh, we, we've we covered some of the headlines about uh, kind of more lawmaker, uh, more backup, if you will, being called in. But it sounds like it's being it's very difficult to actually get to the Capitol to do that. Uh, yes. I mean, at this point, uh, the, the Capitol Police seem to be at least partially overwhelmed. Yeah. Uh, the, again, this is occurring inside the Capitol. And the last we've heard that is reportable from our colleague Billy House uh, is that members in uh, the chamber have been informed that there has been tear gas released in the rotunda of the Capitol. Uh, so this is um, much, much more than just a, a protest outside at this point. Describe for us, if you, you can, Jack, um, for people who haven't been to the Capitol, how this group of, of Trump-backing back, protesters were, were able to perhaps get access into the Capitol. Um, well, I, I've been reporting from the Capitol somewhat regularly since uh, 2014, and nothing like this has ever happened. There, there are protests that can get out of hand, but I, I've never seen anything uh, get to the point where the the Capitol Police struggle like this. There there are, are protests on, around big votes uh, in the Capitol and uh, in in the office buildings where markups occur. Uh, but it's always generally very strictly controlled. You have to go through security to get into any of these facilities. Go through a metal detector. Um, this this is way out of the, what is usual for people to essentially storm the Capitol, and uh, it, it's, it's a high-security area. 
There are all sorts of um, gas masks available if it's needed. There have been lockdowns if there are threats on the Capitol. Um, but really, I, I have never experienced anything like this where clearly it's so far out of hand uh, that, it, again, it's, it's nothing like anything that I've seen in and, the last seven and, years. And Jack, forgive me if you, if you don't know the answer to this, but I mean, I'm just wondering about an, an exit plan here for these lawmakers. Um, I know that many parts of the building are connected underground, but they must have some sort of way to exit the building other than the areas where the protesters are, right? Well, I, I I hate to say this, but it's it's way too late for that. Clearly, because they are in the Capitol building itself, and the the protesters are also in the Capitol building. Wow. What's happening now are police are trying to bolster a door that the protesters are banging on, uh, and it seems now that, according to our colleague Eric Watson, the sergeant at arms is attempting to evacuate the lawmakers. But at this point, I will say we're way past the point where the underground tunnels between the Capitol and the office buildings are relevant because these people are all in the same building. Um, and it appears they're going to have to push their way through a mass of bodies to get people out of there. I do want to mention uh, President Trump one minute ago uh, tweeting, please support our Capitol Police and law enforcement. They are truly on the side of our country. Stay peaceful. You know, that's that's my initial reaction to that tweet is not move away from the lawmakers right now, you know. Right, back move, off. Back it's off. not back That off. is not what the tweet is saying. No, exactly. Like, pre the president right now could send a more forceful message to his supporters uh, to support the Capitol Police. Correct, correct. And, and just to rehash what we just heard, too, is tear gas has been dispersed in the Capitol Rotunda, Per Bloomberg reporters, uh, as we heard, Billy House and Eric Wasson, who are there, lawmakers have been told to get ready to put on gas masks and have retrieved gas masks from under their seats. There is banging on the door uh, to the chamber. So, yeah, exactly. It isn't the president saying, hey, folks, let's get out of the Capitol. Let's do this peacefully. You can protest. We This is, listen, what's interesting is this has been a year where we have seen protest after protest after George Floyd, a lot of peaceful protesting. We've also seen some not so peaceful protesting, but it's just been a year where we understand that everybody has a right to voice how they feel about something, but let's do it peacefully is key. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that our reporters around Washington have, have summed it up incredibly well that this is absolutely unprecedented in, in their coverage over the last few years. And what we're seeing play out today um, is a, a very surprising. All right. So you are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Carol Master, along with Tim Stanovec. And let's just remind everyone that we were seeing um, the certification process going through earlier today. It started at 1 p.m. Uh, as expected. We saw states like Arizona, um, a member of the House of Representatives, then a senator stepping up uh, to not recognize um, the vote. Um, but then we also heard from, um, I think, really unprecedented speeches, especially from the majority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, who basically, and I had to print out the headlines because it really was telling, saying Congress cannot disenfranchise the voters, saying the Senate has a higher call calling them vengeance, and also saying that there was no massive election fraud. So this has been going on at the same time we did see President Trump earlier today also come out and make some comments. We were expecting some protests from his supporters, but it certainly, as the day has gone on and as we've talked about the Capitol being breached, it definitely has picked up a lot of momentum here. Yeah, and, and Carol, as you were doing that recap, we're seeing some new headlines on our Bloomberg Top Live blog that's covering this. Uh, we're seeing a picture now of a bus carrying law enforcement officials that are en route to the Capitol. Uh, police and security are evacuating lawmakers from the U.S. House. That's according to our colleague Tal Barak Harif, who's reporting that. Uh, we're also seeing from our colleague Eric Wasson that lawmakers mm -hmm. have gas masks in their hands on the House floor. That's Eric Wasson from Bloomberg News reporting that. And police, uh, Eric, continuing to report, police are physically trying to bolster the door to the House floor as protesters bang on the door outside. The sergeant in arms has begun evacuating these lawmakers. All right, we're going to try and put up that footage, uh, the live feed in Washington for you again, for those of uh, our listeners, our viewers who are watching on YouTube, so you can get an idea of exactly what's happening in Washington. Jack Fitzpatrick is still with us, congressional reporter for Bloomberg Government. Um, we did see, we were just talking, a bus carrying law enforcement officials are en route to the Capitol, uh, a member of our team putting that out on our live blog. Um, you know, it's hard to say what happens next here, Jack. 
This is um, really, really unprecedented. Uh, the biggest question about what happens next is if we're going to see something that's actually significant from the president uh, rather than a, a tweet that didn't exactly direct people to leave and go home. Um, we haven't gotten any indication that President Trump is, is going to do any more to try to cool this down. So at, at this point, it, it really is a matter of evacuation. Right. And you do wonder, we are expecting some comments from the president-elect, Joe Biden, and you do wonder, you know, whether, uh, you've got to wonder what his team is thinking right now in terms of what he needs to do. He's not the sitting president at the moment, uh, but you do wonder whether there are words that could help um, alleviate this situation or perhaps, um, Jack, exacerbate it. Yeah, well, clearly the, the people protesting who have stormed the Capitol are, are not putting a lot of stock into President-elect Joe Biden's words. Um, what really matters here, though, even though he is not uh, the head of the executive branch, um, there is some independence in terms of lawmakers' ability to direct the Capitol Police, the sergeant-at-arms. Um, so the, it, it is essentially almost outside of the hands of the, the executive branch and up to the legislative branch and its own security uh, to try to keep everybody safe and get them out of here. I don't know what that means for restarting the certification of the votes. That's going to be a, a, compliment, a, a complicated issue. Right. Um, but at this point, Biden probably does not have much of a role, and it's up to the Capitol Police. I just want to point out um, the Trump protesters. This is, again, coming from uh, a New York Post reporter, I believe. Yeah, Steve Nelson at the New York Post. Trump protesters just discharging a fire extinguisher outside the Senate chamber. Many protesters are inside the building, and most people are hiding from them mm. at the same time from the Washington Post, Amy Gardner saying militia members have gathered outside the Georgia Capitol and Brad Raffensperger and senior staff have been escorted out to safety. So some of our latest headlines. Yeah, one more headline here from Eric Wasson, just crossing the Bloomberg. Uh, Eric's reporting that an armed standoff at the House of Representatives. Uh, police officers have their guns drawn at someone who is trying to reach the front door. All right, so hang on for a second, folks. We do want to check in with Charlie Pellet. Just a reminder of what's going on in the market day. Charlie, what do you got for us? Uh, well, let us, first of all, let's cut right to the numbers. We're off session highs. Truly a historic day. Our coverage will continue right here on Bloomberg Radio. S&P off session highs, still up 31 points, a gain of eight-tenths of 1%, looking at records perhaps today. The Dow up 432 right now. That is a gain of 1.4%. Right around 2 o'clock Wall Street time or so, we saw NASDAQ turn lower, down now by 37 points for NASDAQ. Uh, it is down by three-tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ 100 index down now by just about nine-tenths of 1%. Investors are pouring into financial assets today that will benefit from a stronger economy after Democrats look set to take control of Congress, potentially unleashing a torrent of federal spending to revive growth. The 10-year 1.04%, down 25, 30 seconds. Gold is down 1.6%. 1918 the ounce and West Texas intermediate crude now at a 10 month high up five tenths of one percent 50 18 for a barrel of West Texas intermediate crude it is also a Fed Wednesday Federal Reserve officials unanimously backed holding the pace of asset purchases steady when they met last month that according to the latest minutes and the biggest sports betting exchange traded fund rallying today as New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announcing he will support legalizing wagers to help fill the state's nearly $16 billion budget deficit. That ETF, ticker BETS, B-E-T-Z, is up now by 2.75%. Again, recapping, mixed day for the U.S. equity markets, off-session highs, S&P up now by 28, a gain of 8 tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, appreciate that, Charlie. So you are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, Tim Stenovic. Let's bring in uh, our Bloomberg Business National, Bloomberg Business Week National Correspondent, Josh Green author of the book that really explained the 2016 election outcome, Devil's Bargain, Steve Bannon, Donald Trump, and the Nationalist Uprising. He is with us. So is, Stu, uh, so is still Jack Fitzpatrick, congressional reporter for Bloomberg Government. Josh, I do want to kick it off with you. You know, you understood and explained what got Donald Trump to the White House. I do wonder, as you see this unfold um, and you understand the Trump base, uh, are you surprised at all by this reaction? No, not at all. I mean, Trump has been egging on his supporters, uh, you know, promising that there would be violence and riots. And as we've seen, 
um, basically has tried to launch a coup attempt with the support of a good segment of his party. In fact, Trump just in the last 20 minutes has been on Twitter uh, attacking Mike Pence as vice president for not overturning the election results, which is a power Pence doesn't even have. Um, you know, so I, I really don't see how anyone could be surprised by this outcome since it's something the president has egged on all along. Josh, what about when it comes to lawmakers here, Joshua, excuse me, um, when it comes to lawmakers here, um, these representatives and, and uh, senators who in the last week have said, hey, we are going to support the president, we are going to side with the president and argue that these results shouldn't be certified. Um, did they open up a, a can of worms that they can't close? Uh, well, it sure looks like that. I mean, I'm just watching this unfold in real time, as I'm sure a lot of people listening are, and there are Capitol Police with guns drawn in the House gallery trying to fight off or fend off these these protesters. And, you know, the idea, the, the false idea that the election was stolen and the kind of shenanigans is something that's being amplified and buttressed when election, when elected Republicans go out and offer sucker to these, you know, wild and false claims that the president has been making uh, ever since he was defeated on November 3rd. You know, it's almost wild, too, and our folks on YouTube can see this, the live feed, but, you know, here we are looking at the nation's capital. In a few weeks, that will be the site of the next president being sworn in, but it's, it's just kind of... <laughs> The contrast that we have seen this year, Josh, um, you know, I think the thing that has really stood out first, too, is the Republicans that have, you know, either been silent or now have all of a sudden stepped up once again to back Donald Trump. And then to see Mitch McConnell come out and basically say, listen, folks, you know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they won. There was no fraud, again, for him to do it today. The, the breaks that we are seeing, once again, you know, within the Republican Party, what does that mean potentially in two years, in four years? Well, I mean, what we saw from Mitch McConnell today was uh, really a striking and patriotic speech that pulled no punches and sought to, I think, right... Folks, the, the, you know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they won. There was no fraud, again, for him have, to do it today. Um, the, the, the election was stolen. I, I think the credit that McConnell stood up and did that. Um, but I think we can see by the fact that there are, uh, you know, essentially a, a militia has stormed the House gallery now, right. Trump supporters. I, I think we can see that that doesn't really have any effect, that the Republican candidates lost. Uh, I think the reason for that is that Trump has essentially broken the party in two and forced uh, a division between those Republicans who will truck to him and support him no matter what he does, even if it's illegal or unconstitutional, and those like Mitch McConnell who want to regain some uh, semblance of, 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 of normalcy and allow the party to kind of follow the Constitution and the rule of law and move on after Trump departs in two weeks. Joshua, I want to bring Jack Fitzpatrick back in here. He's congressional reporter for Bloomberg Government, and he's on the phone right now from Washington, D.C. Um, Jack, I know you've had your eye on what's happening at the Capitol. What are the latest updates there? Um, it, it, to be honest, I think it is going to be summed up in just absolute how to breach the Capitol. And I know that certainly the efficient resources were available. All right, Frank, as he said, uh, there have been lots of questions, lots of answers later, but right now, the here and now is you've got people who have uh, gathered on both sides of the Capitol. They have uh, essentially uh, stormed the steps there. Some have made their way inside. Police have now set up, uh, at least at some parts of the Capitol, you don't see it in this picture, certainly, but they have set up uh, kind of human chains there in front. Uh, here you've got, uh, they've, they've, they've essentially created a buffer zone uh, in the West Front. By the way, this is the area uh, where uh, uh, Joe Biden will uh, take the oath of office in just a few weeks on that West Front. That's uh, typically where the, the seating is for the uh, inauguration, the swearing of a new president. Um, so the crowd there has been, it's a little bit of a higher climb 
to enter from that side, um, and, and thus you see most of the crowd here on the east side now, the, the east front, as it's known, of, of the Capitol. Uh, we've been talking off and on with Frank Thorpe. He's an NBC News producer who, uh, like everyone in the Capitol right now, is in lockdown. Uh, Frank, it has to be an eerie feeling. You're watching these pictures, and you're inside the building, but you really can't see what's happening. Uh, what are you hearing? Yeah, it's it's a it's a confusing situation, uh, Lester. Because to be honest, a lot of the members of the um, who who just don't feel comfortable, who want to want to get out of the Capitol, have no idea if they can leave, and we have no idea where the protesters are, are inside the building. Um, I can tell you, uh, you know, going back to the video that we saw earlier of the protesters walking towards the House chamber, um, it, it's just I, I can't I can't stress to you how how just unprecedented this situation is in terms of having this many people inside the Capitol that have not been screened. I mean, as you noted, a lot of these protesters have, are, are peaceful, um, but just having people within the Capitol who haven't gone through the screening process to get into this building is one is that, that that's concerning to not only the lawmakers, but the aides that are here that are locked down in their offices, the press that are locked down in their offices as well. We have Another producer, Haley Talbot, who is currently in the process of trying to get out of the House chamber. She was there to, to cover the House proceedings during the, the debate, and she's been been taken out of the House chamber. But she's trying to figure out how they can how they can actually get out of the building. Um, she's just with members of Congress who say that they're, they're calling their families to say that they're okay. Um, I mean, I can tell you that you know most of the members of the press here are doing the same, just to give them an update. But it's a tense feeling. Yeah, uh, Frank Thorpe, thank you for that update, uh, finishing the thought. A tense situation, uh, to be sure, as we, uh, we, at least in this video, we see uh, folks walking back and forth in plain view of police officers. We don't know what their orders are or what the, uh, or what the plan is, but uh, no one in this crowd seems to be uh, uh, aggressive, but simply walking, uh, exercising free reign of the Capitol, an area that, as Frank had pointed out, has been closed off to the to the general public for months and months uh, because of uh, COVID uh, protocols and restrictions. But now, uh, inside and, and very close to that House chamber, where uh, a number of people uh, remain right now, very concerned about what is going to happen here, uh, how they plan to clear uh, the Capitol. Will it involve uh, any any chemical agents? Are there enough uh, gas masks? So these are, are, are questions uh, I don't think any of us woke up thinking we'd be asking uh, as this process began, this joint session of Congress to entertain uh, the objections, kind of the last gasp of Republicans trying to throw a monkey wrench into the results of the election, um, the conclusion, a foregone one, uh, but nonetheless um, a, a demonstration by some members of both the Senate and House and a determination to challenge uh, some of the, the battleground state victories uh, for Joe Biden. But here is where we at, are at right now, a scene, as I noted, not unlike ones we've seen over the years uh, in uh, over disputed elections in faraway places on the globe. Um, but this is America. This is the U.S. Capitol right now. Uh, there is the American flag and, and beneath it these crowds of people now who have stormed, um, trying to make their wishes known. Um, this is a day in which the, the president spoke, even as his own vice president uh, announced that he could essentially no longer support this idea of trying to turn the election upside down. Uh, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, in a very impassioned remarks uh, in, at the beginning of debate, um, uh, saying that those who support these objections are, are an embarrassment to themselves and the embarrassment to their country. Uh, so he also uh, breaking ranks with the president, um, but uh, Donald Trump continuing to press forward his claim uh, that he uh, he's due a second term. And you can see police have, uh, this is again the west, oh, we just switched, but that other shot you were looking at was the west front where police have been able to establish some kind of a barrier and stopping the crowds. Uh, it's appeared to have detained someone there, uh, but by and large they have held their ground there. And you can see they put up a pretty, uh, pretty serious line of, of, uh, of blue uh, on those, I believe those are the bleachers that have been put in place for uh, the inauguration um, on the west side, where that is typically held. Let me bring in um, Casey. I'm sorry. Let me bring in. Um, 
Hallie, uh, Hallie Jackson uh, to, to get some more perspective. So the president uh, is acknowledging yeah. what is happening here, but doesn't seem to be taking great steps to tell people to go home. He's done a tweet. I mean, he's done a single tweet here, Lester. And even for some people who used to work for him, uh, you are seeing a groundswell uh, of some, at least, saying, you need to do more, Mr. President, basically. He is probably the only person, and it's even arguable at that, uh, who could potentially get that message through to the people who are now, as you put it succinctly, uh, Lester, earlier in the show, putting the United States Capitol under siege. That, that is what we are seeing at this moment. You have to remember, Lester, um, this is a building, and, I, and I'm looking at this, I've done countless, you know, live shots, shows from the building in and out. Um, it just doesn't look like this, right? There's security around the building, but more importantly, Lester, uh, or equally importantly, there's also private homes, there's daycares, there are other, you know, facilities unconnected to the functioning of government, right, that are in the vicinity of the Hill where we're, where we're talking about here. Um, and this is affecting many more people than just the people you're seeing on the screens, than just the duly elected officials of this country. Uh, key, first and foremost, first priority, safety. There's also a question, secondarily, as you are looking at that shot, it appeared somebody uh, being pulled out on a stretcher. Secondarily, is what happens now? We understand, as we've been reporting here, this lockdown is happening at the Capitol. What does this mean for the process that, you know, two hours ago, Lester, we started talking about the Electoral College vote count? I can tell you that I've been uh, texting with sources um, and one Republican uh, official uh, suggesting that perhaps this will, maybe, they hope, give some senators pause in continuing the objections in the vote count. We don't know that that's actually going to be the case. We don't know how this is going to impact the actual procedures. I think the, the biggest priority for folks right now is making sure that the people inside the building are safe. Y you have to wonder, Lester, I ask this question, where is the president? We know physically where President Trump is. We understand, uh, based on uh, the reporting from people uh, in the pool at the White House, he was in the Oval Office at least for a portion of the afternoon here as these protests, now a, frankly, mob stormed the steps of the Capitol. Is he going to speak on television? Is he going to give an address and give remarks? We don't have any guidance on that. We have no reason to suspect he might, other than that is perhaps the expectation of the country's leader at a moment like this, this just surreal and extraordinary moment, uh, and one that's going to go down in American history, Lester. So again, first priority, safety. Secondarily, yeah. how do you... How do you get past this moment? I know that you, know, you got to imagine these officers, and we're seeing it coming in from all parts. This is what I'm talking about, Lester. You're looking at the Capitol complex, and then that's um, that's Constitution, right? So that is on the House side. The House office buildings are in that. I think this is our chopper shot from our local affiliate, if I'm guessing correctly. You can see those House office buildings on the other side of the street. The underground passages that you're talking about connect those different facilities. The street obviously shut down, police in place. The other piece of this is the, the law in enforcement presence. We, this rally had been, what was originally a rally, which has turned into something very different, um, had been planned. It was a known event. It was known that people who were supporting President Trump were traveling in from all over the country to be on the National Mall at the Ellipse, where the president, by the way, spoke, right, didn't just watch. He actually actively went and spoke and engaged with those protesters. Uh, and now hear what we're seeing at the Capitol, Lester. All right, uh, Hallie, thank you. On the phone with us right now is Republican Representative Adam Kinzinger from Illinois. Congressman, uh, thank you for joining us. First of all, are you and your colleagues safe right now? Yeah, everybody's safe. Uh, I don't want to give uh, my location, but I'll tell you this is, uh, this is madness. And, uh, and anybody that calls themselves a Republican like myself uh, should be very ashamed right now. And uh, I, I, I don't know if this has ever happened in history. It's disgusting, and this is not how democracies and how politics works. I don't think a lot of folks would disagree with you on that. Uh, can you tell us, uh, did, you were in the middle of debate. Uh, was there simply an, an adjournment, and you were taken to a, a special place? I mean, how did, it, how did it all play out from your point of view? Yeah, in my case, I kind of started seeing things unfurl, so I came back to a different location, And uh, but I have been talking to people that are on the floor, and, you know, obviously when the Capitol was breached, uh, they, they did security protocol, which they're good at, but, you know, significantly outnumbered, uh, throwing on escape hoods. I mean, we have these, you know, emergency escape hoods that we think it's one of those doomsday scenarios that we'll never use. We're using those. 
And uh, right now, I think it's, it's a matter of hoping that cooler heads prevail, hoping that the president actually quits being a coward and calls in the D.C. Guard and actually takes some leadership for a moment. Uh, but, you know, until then, we're going to continue to do what we need to do to be safe. Are, are you uh, what we're watching right now? Do you lay that at the president's feet? Uh, do I think Wait, say that again? I couldn't understand that. Yeah, yeah, what we're watching right now with the siege of the Capitol, do you lay this at the president's feet? Is he responsible? Yeah, I mean, look, a absolutely. You know, not just in his speech today where he basically implied this was going to happen. We've seen this all over Twitter. I don't look at Parler, but I hear it's been all over Parler. This is not a surprise to anybody and shouldn't be. And I've said for weeks that I fear violence on January 6th. And for the president to go out today... When everybody's in a heightened emotional state after being falsely promised that somehow Congress can magically pick the next president, uh, he completely shirked his responsibility as president to keep the American people safe. The a number of as you a number of your colleagues in the House and certainly a number from the Senate have uh, announced and they've already demonstrated that they are going to try to reject some of these electoral votes. Uh, do you think that this will stop the process, or do you think that they will want to carry on once uh, order is restored there? Well, because the Constitution, you know, is enduring, the process will go forward. If, if any of my friends or colleagues continue with the objection, uh, I think that is, is a disgrace. I think the reality is, first off, it was a fool's errand anyway. It was a grift, an attempt to raise money. And now, after this, if we, uh, you know, assuage these actions, we can only expect more in the future. What was it like? Uh, I don't know if you actually heard um, uh, Majority Leader, Senate Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell's remarks today, but he essentially, yeah, so he essentially broke ranks with the president and said, it's over. It's, it's, it's done in, in so many words. Um, what was it like to hear that? Well, I, you know, it was it was good. I wish he'd have said it a while ago. Um, but, you know, the bottom line is we have too many people out here that want to avoid temporary pain by telling people what they don't want to hear. So they go along with this, I, this magical idea that Congress gets to pick the president. Congress doesn't. And, uh, and, and what we're seeing now is, you know, the result of false hope given to people. And so it was great to see the majority leader say that. I hope all the leadership in the House and Senate say the exact same thing. And I hope when we reconvene finally that we move forward and just accept the results as the American people uh, voted for, whether we like those results or not. I, I think it's fair to say that much of your party will bear some of the stain of, of, of this day uh, going forward. There is also the vote in Georgia that we're watching very closely that when all is said and done, we could look, be looking at a Democratic-held uh, Senate. Uh, how serious is the damage to the Republican Party going forward? I think it's serious. I, I think, you know, did we make gains within minority communities? Sure, but we're losing in one very terminal demographic, and that is young people. As young people grow older, they're rejecting Republican politics. We've gotten away from the Reagan-esque idea of explaining the compassion of conservatism, and we've relegated to a culture war. That's not the Republican Party that me at 42 years old was in love with. I, I love the idea of a strong American leadership and, and leadership around the globe. We have to get back to that, but we're going to bear the consequences of this for a little bit. Before, before I let you go, have you or any of your colleagues, is there any uh, effort right now to try and get in touch with the White House and say, please make this stop? I, I don't know. Uh, I think right now it's kind of the, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We're at the bottom of that and just getting through this moment. Uh, but I certainly hope people with rank in the House are doing that and in the Senate. And uh, and we go beyond some, you know, tweet saying thank you to the Capitol Police. And we actually start calling for real action to restore order to the people's house. Otherwise, we're no different uh, than any of, you know, these failed democracies around the world. All right. Well, Congressman Adam Kinzinger, Republican from Illinois, we thank you for being with us. And, and we're, we're grateful that you and your colleagues uh, are OK right now. Please stay safe, sir. Thank you, sir. 
All right, we uh, continue to watch this crowd outside the Capitol. Uh, it began as a day of peaceful protest, and largely what we've seen, at least in the view of the camera, has been peaceful. Nonetheless, this crowd has breached uh, beyond uh, where they were supposed to be. Uh, they've, uh, many have, have breached, actually, inside the Capitol itself. So this is an, an ongoing situation. We don't know what's happening on the law enforcement level inside uh, to contain those who went in unscreened and based on the pictures we've seen, have had largely a free reign of, of very critical parts of the Capitol. But that is how it is playing out right now. Ellison Barber uh, is on the east front of the Capitol, on the edge of this crowd, watching it all play out. Uh, how would you characterize things right now, Ellison? Hey, Lester, we're starting to see people come down from the steps who are claiming at least to have been inside. Uh, two people came by and walked by us and they said, we made it inside. I asked them if they wanted to talk and they said I probably shouldn't and kept going. There was another uh, guy in, in militia-like tan garb who walked by us and I think he didn't see my microphone initially and he said we made it to Nancy's office. When I asked him to stop and talk to us, he also declined on that. But there's kind of been, if those people were in fact inside, a, a celebratory mood here for them as they make their way out. Uh, you can see up on the steps here where people are still gathered off to the left side of the steps. Capitol Police have kind of congregated in a group there and they've they've been there for the last little bit kind of just standing by to the side of these protesters. We have seen a couple snipers or what appear to be snipers on the roof of the U.S. Capitol. Uh, other than that though the situation on this side has remained somewhat calm. It's, it's not really the right word for this, but as you said, we have not seen any uh, acts of violence, per se, right in front of us, but we have seen a uh, forceful crowd as they made their way up to the front and initially passed through those bicycle barricades. They are still here, and as some people come out and claim to have been inside the U.S. Capitol, those people are then being greeted amongst this crowd as, as heroes of sorts, being cheered for going for going inside. Uh, one person who had come out, they were, uh, they had some sort of liquid water type thing on them. They said that they had been uh, sprayed. But again, though, none of those people were willing to speak with us on camera. You can hear the crowd right now cheering some uh, as they have flags, many of them Trump flags. A don't tread on me flag held uh, on both sides now have been uh, put on the have been hoisted up kind of on the sides there. So this, this crowd has stayed here where they are, Capitol Police uh, on the side, not seeming to necessarily engage with the crowd here. But as I said, we haven't seen any sort of violent acts from the crowd here, but people who, who are claiming to have been inside are being celebrated as they make their way out. Lester? Yeah, Allison, stand by a second. I just want to share uh, uh, from uh, our investigative producer, Tom Witter, a spokesperson for the Washington, D.C. Fire and EMS, says they have uh, several people have been treated for injuries, and uh, there's an unconfirmed report, we'll wait to confirm it, uh, of a, of a more, uh, even more serious uh, uh, a nature that we'll try to uh, firm up. But, uh, Allison, as we you know, watch this crowd, many of these people had... Uh, gone to a protest, an organized, permitted uh, a protest today, and and have followed the crowd here. Have you seen any children in the crowd? Yeah, quite a few, actually. I don't know if we can see, if we can walk a little and show you some of, of the people who are here. Uh, at various points throughout the day, we have seen families. We have seen people here with their dogs, with their pets. We were here all morning. We've been here since about 8 a.m. There's a, a dog right over there. There you have it. Uh, people, this was a peaceful protest. People were here. They were vocal. They wanted their voices heard, but things were relatively calm. And in a split second, you saw the crowd rush the front towards the barricades and make their way up here. And it felt like the entire mood, the whole day, it changed. We have not seen any overt acts of violence, but as soon as this is where the initial breach was right over here, as soon as that initial breach happened, we did see once we made our way up to the front and we saw somebody being put on a stretcher and taken out of here. I'm not sure if she fell, she was pushed over or what, but there was a lot of blood left on the ground where someone had clearly been hurt in the process, maybe inadvertently, but in the process of these barricades being breached and making their way up here. But not as many children here right now, and some people I think have stayed a little bit further back. But yeah, I mean, this was a largely peaceful protest. A lot of people had come throughout the day. At one point, 
uh, a group of people dressed in militia-like garb, who I believe were Proud Boys. They're not wearing their normal uh, attire that they wear, but they were saying a term that Proud Boy tends to say and chant as they walk around. They had been kind of walking around the perimeter at one point of the U.S. Capitol and chanting. But other than that, things were calm. And then in that split second, you saw the crowd rush. You saw people break through these bicycle uh, barricades and make their way up to the Capitol and everything everything changed. But yeah, a lot of families have been here throughout the day, though some, some seem to have dispersed and left at this point. Lester? All right, Allison, thank you very much. As we watch this extraordinary situation play out, it's hard not to look at this and not feel that there are at least, and, and not to be hyperbolic, but, but to feel that there's some elements of, of a coup attempt in, in what we're watching right now. I want to go to Frank Thorpe. We've been hearing from him by telephone. He's in his office there, our NBC producer uh, office there in the Capitol under lockdown. I understand you have some video, Frank. Yeah, so, uh, Lester, this is some stunning video, I have to say. I, I don't think I, I've ever expected to see anything like this in my entire career covering Congress. The idea of, of people who have broken into the Capitol and, and taken over the Senate floor. This is about a dozen um, folks who came from outside, and they're just mulling around looking through desks. Um, the, there's a guy sitting there in the, in the gallery above. He asked, who are you with? Who are you with? And that's, that was about time that was for me to go. Uh, walking through the hallways, I have to say, it, it's a weird scene um, in that there was, you know, some protesters that were walking through the hallways, and Capitol Police were kind of following them, but they weren't necessarily arresting them. It's really unclear as to how they're really dealing with the protesters. I haven't seen any arrests, but I've also been locked in this, up in, you know, in, in our in our offices. So um, we're just sheltered in place at the moment right now. But I have to say that this scene that you're seeing right now on television is, is just is absolutely stunning. The idea that these people have come from outside and broken into the Capitol and decided to, to take the, the Senate floor like this, where you know, just about an hour and a half or two hours ago, um, they, they were debating an objection to the Electoral College. It's just a stunning scene. Who are you with? Uh, stunning doesn't even begin to describe it, Frank. Um, if, if this picture makes you sick, you're, I, I think you're probably not alone. This is inside uh, the chambers of the American Congress, people freely walking among the, among the tables and the desks. It, it's just, just beyond unbelievable. Hey, Amy Lester, uh, I want to go to Ken. Just to, just, yeah. you know, just, to, just to kind of nail down on this point, though, I mean, you know, they still need to finish this count. They still need to be able to return here and do their work. And there's no way that this will require sweeps. I mean, once they actually clear the building, they'll have to sweep the chamber. I mean, the chamber, the, the two chambers of the House and the Senate are, are basically known within the Capitol as some two of the safest places in the entire Capitol Hill complex. I mean, they, and, and they're protected by Capitol Police. There are details for leadership members. I mean, it, it, this is this is just a like a, a completely outside of the realm of possibility situation in which that you know it's going to take a, a, an enormous amount of time just to clear out and to do a security sweep of the desks, of the hallways, of the rooms before they were they would be able to even start to, to count again. All right, uh, Frank, continue to stay safe uh, inside there. On the phone with us is Democratic Congressman Brendan Boyle from uh, Pennsylvania. Congressman, uh, first of all, are you, are you in a safe location and okay with your colleagues? Uh, Congressman uh, Boyle, do you hear me okay? Okay, we've, we've lost him. We'll try to get him back and get a perspective of what's happening inside uh, with members of Congress. I want to go to Kelly O'Donnell. Kelly was uh, at that rally that uh, where, where this, um, this is an offshoot of that rally. Uh, you heard the president speak today. Give us a sense of the tone and, and things we heard that might have suggested it would end up uh, where, what we're looking at. Well, spending hours today with some of the Trump supporters who are now protesters, uh, the president repeatedly urged them to fight. And he meant that 
metaphorically, but he also may have meant that in this kind of show and demonstration. He repeatedly said, we will walk down Pennsylvania Avenue to the U.S. Capitol. And I began that march walking along with a number of those in attendance, and I could hear people around me, Lester, saying, the president said he's walking with us. I knew that the president had returned to the White House, but his supporters believed he was walking with them. One man who was just next to me said, but he said he's walking, so I'm sure he's walking. It's just an anecdote that gives you an idea of how the president has this kind of powerful connection with his supporters. He has just tweeted again in the last few minutes, and he says, I am asking everyone at the U.S. Capitol to remain peaceful, no violence. Remember, we in uppercase are the party of law and order. Respect the law and order of our great men and women in blue. Thank you. But this is the same president who repeatedly told them to fight, repeatedly told his supporters that he was robbed of this election, and they were too, that their votes were discounted, manipulated, thrown out uh, by various states, uh, things that have not been supported by the facts, and in many ways incited this kind of fervor. The president always measures how he is being perceived by his crowd size, and there was an enormous crowd today. And as you can see this play out, as Ellison pointed out, certainly Certainly, there were families there. There were several people with dogs. Uh, I'm one of those dog people who always talks to the people who are walking their dogs with uh, these kinds of events. And there were the flags, and there were all of the things that, in a typical Trump rally environment before the election, uh, were much more upbeat. These folks were determined to walk to the Capitol and to, to make their message known. Many of them probably did not know it was going to turn into this. But clearly, some people planned this kind of breach of the Capitol, and in many ways, the kind of images that Frank, our colleague, was just showing us, a, a disrespect of these institutions that they are angry about. There was so much talk today among Trump supporters and those speaking at the rally prior to the president about anger toward even Republicans believing that there were Republicans who were not standing up for President Trump. And, of course, we heard the president repeatedly urge Mike Pence, his vice president, who has been unfailingly loyal for four years, to do what the president wanted today. Mike Pence did not do that in a lengthy statement where he explained the, what he believes to be the limits constitutionally of his role. And now we have this, with an uncertain way of how this gets resolved. Today is the day the counts are supposed to be completed. That has been disrupted. As Frank and other colleagues have described, the scene at the Capitol remains tense, volatile, and unknown. I've been in touch with uh, various elected officials that I know from my time covering the Capitol. All have said they are safe, but in a new world that few uh, could have imagined. It was predicted, and yet still so hard to imagine as we watch this unfold. Lester? All right. Hey, Kelly, thanks very much for that. Uh, as we watch uh, these live pictures, this is the uh, east front of the Capitol, and that crowd continuing to uh, occupy the steps and uh, surrounding the entrance there. Uh, on the phone with us, we're going to try again, Democratic Congressman, uh, actually, with uh, Democratic Congresswoman from Virginia, Abigail Spanberger. Congresswoman, uh, can you tell us, are you safe and in, in, in an okay place right now? Uh, yes, thank you so much, Lester. I am. I'm in a uh, holding room with a lot of other members of Congress after we were evacuated out of the floor in the gallery area. Can you tell us how, how things played out when you became aware of that the Capitol had been breached and, and how you were let out? Uh, so we initially got um, alert uh, on our phone. The Capitol Police were just uh, extraordinary in keeping us updated. Uh, we all got out our gas masks, which are under the seats on the floor and in the gallery, uh, because we know that there was some uh, chemical irritants that were deployed in various parts of the Capitol. And um, so we, we made a couple, a couple efforts at uh, trying to evacuate, but uh, at one point that became difficult because there were people banging on the doors of the floor um, of the House of Representatives. Um, and so at that point in time, uh, there was an effort to you know, of course, lock all the doors and barricade the doors. Um, and it took multiple efforts for us to be able to make our way safely um, and then depart the, the Capitol and gallery areas where we were gathered to participate in what is our, you know, constitutional duty of counting electors. It's, uh, it's a straightforward process that is supposed to be procedural, um, but one that um, it, it, we were intending to carry out today until it was interrupted. 
Did you come face to face with any of the protesters? Um, I, you know, I did not. We, where we were um, on our way out, there were protesters who were laid out in the prone position. Uh, Capitol Police had um, clearly taken control of the, of the situation, um, and as they were leading us and members of the press out, um, that was at that point as, as close as we got, um, kind of person to person. Were you, uh, were you and, and your colleagues wearing uh, gas masks as you were leaving? Um, it, some people were, so we all had them. We had them opened. We had them deployed. Um, there was um, some people were saying that we needed to put them on. Um, some didn't have them on, uh, but everybody was ready because, again, um, in, in, in the end, the way we actually uh, evacuated out of the gallery, we did not go in the direction where there was the, the chemical irritant. Um, and so I, I had mine on for a bit, but mostly had it off and, and didn't come in contact with any of the irritant. All right, well, we're, we're glad you're okay. So let's talk now about what we are seeing, what is happening outside the, the Capitol. Um, give me your thoughts, um, how we got here, uh, and where do we go forward? You know, I'm a, I'm a former intelligence officer, and my whole background is understanding the challenges that foreign governments are facing. Um, the scene that we saw on Capitol Hill the banging, the yelling, the screaming, the demands to enter the, the chamber of um, the United States Congress, those are the sorts of things that happen in, in third world nations, the sorts of places where our diplomats and intelligence officers write home to the United States and say, you know, this is a dangerous scenario. This is a an endangered democracy. Um, it's, it's deeply, deeply disturbing what we saw um, at the U.S. Capitol today. And um, but my again, my appreciation to the Capitol Police for doing everything they possibly could to keep us, our staff, our teams, um, the cafeteria workers, sanitation workers, and employees of the Capitol and members of the press safe um, as they worked to systematically ensure that active threats were subdued um, and uh, and that we could get to a safe place. All right, Representative uh, Abigail Spanberger from Virginia, thank you for taking some time to speak with us. We're glad you and, and your colleagues are okay. Thank you so much. And again, thanks to the Capitol Police and Metro Police who's been responding to help as well. Thank you so much, Lester. Yep. All right. Yes. And we see the Capitol Police there have taken up a position on the west side of the Capitol there in the, in the yellow jackets up there, the uh, high visibility yellow, um, keeping the line of protesters from entering at least that side. Uh, but uh, clearly a, a situation that uh, is, is, is beyond anything most people could imagine uh, taking place right now. I do want to go to uh, Pete Williams, if, if Pete is standing by, because it was brought up a moment ago. What we saw today, the beginning of this, this joint session of Congress, whether there's objections or not, uh, Pete, there's, there's, there's something magic to this date. It has to happen today, correct? It has to start today. That's certainly right. That's set by statute. That's the Electoral Account Act. That's this law that was passed 133 years ago that guides the process. Now, it doesn't say it has to end today, but it has to start today. So it's it's met that constitutional requirement. And of course, at some point when this is all resolved, it's it's going to be uh, it's going to resume. And it doesn't really matter how long it takes. I mean, they've got until the 20th, obviously, which is inauguration day. Um, a, a couple of thoughts, Lester. Number one. Um, um, the, this scene is obviously going to cause some serious rethinking about how the inauguration itself will be planned. Now, we knew it was already scaled back because of the pandemic, no parade, for example, but uh, you just know, and I just got off the phone with one law enforcement person, they're already, they're looking at these scenes and, and thinking, well, what changes do they need to make in the plan for the inaugural. Now, I will say that an inauguration is a much bigger event that involves many more law enforcement organizations. Uh, there's much tighter security, but still, it's, there's got to be some rethinking. Uh, one other thing, Lester, uh, we've been told now by two separate law enforcement organizations. You saw a picture earlier of a person being wheeled out of the Capitol, um, or at least being wheeled outside the Capitol on a gurney with uh, apparent injuries. And uh, we're told now by two separate law enforcement agencies that one person was shot inside the U.S. Capitol uh, a short time ago by a member of law enforcement. Now, we don't know 
what law enforcement person this was, whether it was someone from the Capitol Police, from Metro Police. I mean, there are a number of different police agencies that are responsible for security in that area. And when there is something like this, there's a, you know, uh, uh, an all hands on deck kind of response from a number of different police agencies uh, that can respond to help police and federal agencies. So we don't know which in which organization was involved, but we're t and we don't know what the condition was of the, uh, is of, of the person who was shot. But and we don't know the circumstances of it. All all I can report is that uh, law enforcement officials tell us that one person was shot inside the U.S. Capitol by a member of law enforcement. All right, uh, uh, Peter Williams, thank you for adding that. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary that we have not, um, there's, right now it seems to be no effort, uh, at least from the outside, to remove anyone. Um, um, but at the same time, no one here is advancing. The picture has remained rather constant here on both sides of the Capitol. Uh, you know, people crowded in, waving, waving flags, essentially moving their rally to the, uh, to the um, doorsteps of, of the Capitol as uh, members of Congress have been ushered to safe places. We heard a description a moment ago of, of uh, reaching for gas masks that had uh, uh, positioned at their desks and, and some of them actually donning them as they, as they made their way to safer areas, still hearing the beating of people trying to get in the door. So um, an extraordinary scene continuing to unfold there. Um, let me bring in, if I can right now, uh, Hallie Jackson uh, again. Hallie, you've been uh, watching all this play out. Um, is this a fear that you had heard expressed, uh, you know, from, from those associated with the White House, that something like this could happen? Here's the thing, Lester, for, for people who have tracked um, movements in many ways among people, sort of the fringe elements of what you could call the president's base, there had been discussion of this day specifically for a while now, right, uh, which is, is raising the question, as Pete's talked about, um, and as others, of the law enforcement presence. That is obviously something that, as you showed on that shot, you could see some of the presence here at the Capitol, but this just incredibly upsetting, I think it's fair to say, scene at the Capitol. Um, I, I will say that you are now seeing more and more, Lester, people who are close to the president, and I'm going to try to pull this up, uh, Mick Mulvaney, I believe, is among them, calling on the president to say something. Uh, his, his allies, his aides getting out there on Twitter, sure, uh, saying, hey, stop, this is not okay, this is not appropriate, this is not who we are. The president's former campaign manager, for example, doing the same, but now there are some who are, who are pushing the president president publicly, Lester, to try to come out and do something more forcefully. Uh, this is a president who, as, as our colleague Kelly O'Donnell noted, ended his speech at the rally, what was then a rally several hours ago earlier this morning, by telling people, we're going to walk up to the Capitol, basically. Uh, it, amping them up, uh, to, use, to use that kind of language, to, to come up to the Capitol. And what f was, and I was, on the ca I was on Capitol Hill, Lester, not, not three, four hours ago, and I'm telling you, I saw from our, our own eyes, it was not, didn't look like this, obviously. It was a mostly peaceful protest. It has turned into something very different, much uglier now. Uh, you will see, moving forward, discussion about what the president has been doing, where he has been for these last two hours, for these last two and a half hours, uh, and the moment of leadership. There will be critics who will suggest that the president uh, has not met some of those moments in the past, um, but now you're seeing even some of his allies talk about this. For example, uh, Kevin McCarthy, of course, the, the minority leader over on the House side, sounding rather shaken. He was over on another network calling this un-American, suggesting that, yes, he, he would perhaps have people reach out to the president and see if he would do more. Now, the president has tweeted two times, two tweets, in the couple of hours that we've been watching this, um, but the leadership factor on this is going to be critical. The other point that I want to make, Lester, um, you know, I live in I live in Washington. That's obviously where I'm reporting to you from now. It's 3:30 in the afternoon. It will get dark in a matter, of, you know, in a matter of 90 minutes or so, um, and you still have thousands of people out on on the the two the west front, the east front of the Capitol. 
they've got to clear these folks before this situation potentially gets even more disturbing. I can tell you that I know people who are having their kids, who don't have anything to do with Capitol Hill, who are having their kids affected because of the, the lockdowns that have been in place now, you know, their families. Um, this is a ripple effect. It's why you've seen the mayor of Washington institute that 6 o'clock curfew. Um, and at that point, that could be a potential tension point, Lester, if, in fact, uh, these, pro these people, these, these people who are storming the Capitol are still out there. Hallie, thank you. I want to bring in Andrea Mitchell right now. Uh, Andrea, you have seen and, and covered it all. Um, give me your thoughts about what's happening here. And also, I'm curious whether this might derail the objections that were planned uh, for this long process of counting these electoral votes today. Well, I certainly think on the Senate side, I would find it very difficult for Senator Cruz and Senators Hawley and the others to now have to face not only Mitch McConnell, but the rest of their colleagues who have had this uh, horrible, you know, really violent protest because they broke into the capital of the United States of America. They hijacked our democracy while the Electoral College vote count, the vote was being counted. It was already certified, but it, it was being counted. And the process is going to pick up. They'll figure this out. I was talking earlier, interviewing Terry Gaynor, the former head of the Capitol Police, former sergeant at arms, and he said they will, bit by bit, they will move enough people in. They have, you know, more than a thousand Capitol Police. Clearly, they did not prevent the Capitol building from being breached, from being breached on the second floor level, as you saw on the east front. That was where they got in, apparently, to both the Senate and the House floor and to the same level as Statuary Hall. So what you saw were these protesters in the chambers, in the Senate chamber, in the House chamber. Uh, thankfully, the Capitol Police had removed Vice President Pence, uh, certainly CSP, uh, uh, Senator Pro Tem Chuck Grassley, who's also in the in the succession chain, uh, also the Speaker of the House, we understand all of them, all the senators are now in safe places. You have members of the House and others who were off the floor because of COVID, not part of the joint session, who were planning their speeches. We talked to Alyssa um, Slotkin from Michigan, who was planning her speech. She's a former Pentagon and CIA official who has served in Iraq at the same time, saying she's never even contemplated anything like this. And what she said was, you expect you expect attacks in places like Iraq in wartime. You don't expect it in the Capitol building of the United States. The only time I've ever seen the Capitol evacuated was after 9-11, when we thought that that plane was coming, the plane that uh, ended up, uh, you know, heading towards Pennsylvania. Uh, we thought that that head plane, I believe it was that plane, was coming to the Capitol building. And that's when they were evacuated through a tunnel and safely uh, further up Independence Avenue. So I've never seen anything like this, and I have to say, it is shocking, and it was started really by the President of the United States inciting that crowd, and that is as shocking as the failure of the police to prevent the Capitol building from being breached. Andrea Mitchell, uh, thank you for your insight uh, there. I want to bring in uh, my colleague uh, Savannah Guthrie right now as we continue our expanded coverage. We're a little past 3.30 uh, here in the east, and this uh, siege, if you will, continues to go on. Uh, welcome, uh, Savannah. Welcome to a scene we never thought we would witness, Lester. What's happening in the U.S. Capitol this afternoon? I'll bring you up to date on what I've seen. The governor of Virginia has tweeted that he has answered a request for the Virginia National Guard to help out and to try to regain some sense of control at the Capitol right now. As mentioned, there are reports that one woman has been shot uh, reportedly by law enforcement. We await more information about that. Uh, we have seen those images, disturbing images of, our, of protesters inside the Capitol, breaching the Capitol, inside the Speaker's office, inside the Senate chamber, walking about freely as though this were not the heart of our democracy, performing its moment, its most sacred moment of the peaceful transition to power. These are momentous times. I want to bring Casey Hunt into this. She's our Capitol Hill correspondent. She's been there from the beginning. First of all, Casey, just uh, we can all save the analysis for later. Just bring us up to date on what you know and what the status is of getting this situation under control. 
been the hardest piece of this to pin down what they're going to do next uh, to try and get this under control. As you mentioned, those requests uh, from the National Guard to try and help deal with this situation, but whether they are en route is unclear. Remember, the District of Columbia falls uh, into a, a little bit of a, a strange spot because it's not a state. So uh, questions about what uh, the Defense Department may do uh, in that instance, we are waiting uh, to find out and are in touch with the Speaker's office. But it has been uh, an incredibly uh, difficult day here on Capitol Hill. It started, of course, uh, with the initial proceedings to begin the process to ratify uh, President-elect Joe Biden as President of the United States. That all unfolded, it seemed, uh, as, as it should have at the beginning. But of course, these protesters approached the building, uh, ultimately breached uh, the Capitol, and then breached the House and Senate floors, uh, which is not something I, I, I don't think anyone who uh, was walking into this building today anticipated. And uh, certainly, those of us who have uh, been working up here every day for many, many years now have never seen uh, anything like this uh, before. So you are seeing increasingly Republicans uh, coming out and calling on President Trump to urge the people who are here to stand down. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, the House leader, uh, was recently interviewed on Fox News. He called it un-American. He said it needs to stop. He said that he didn't even want to talk about some of the things that he had seen uh, in the chamber. He referenced uh, shots fired and I know our Pete Williams uh, reported that. Uh, our producer Haley Talbot was in the House of Representatives uh, in the gallery watching the floor as events unfolded there as the Capitol Police barricaded one of the doors as they evacuated uh, members of the House of Representatives, Many, uh, some of those members donning gas masks that are uh, situated under the chairs in that chamber because uh, there were chemical irritants that were discharged in the attempts to try and clear uh, these protests. So at this point, we do know uh, members of the congressional leadership are safe. Members of the House and Senate are being taken to undisclosed locations, most of them already in those uh, undisclosed locations if, if, they, if they weren't part uh, of, those initial, of those initial groups. I've, I've texted with several uh, members of the Senate who have said that they are safe, that uh, they feel safe at this point. So it does seem as though that element of this has been diffused at least. The last uh, few minutes here have felt more like stasis. The, uh, the members who are involved in, in the actual functioning of our government have been removed from the immediate danger of the situation. And now the question is, how are they going to move forward and secure the building? So uh, we are here uh, in the uh, Russell Senate office building where things have been largely quiet. Across the street, of course, the Capitol building, uh, where you can see those protesters uh, still milling around. But again, yeah. Savannah, uh, important to underscore, this has halted uh, the process, well, the regular process where, of our government. Yeah, Casey, that's where I was going. I mean, I, this is January 6th. This is an a, a date um, that was in stone. This is when you're supposed to uh, certify the electors for the, the transition of power. I mean, that obviously is not possible right now. Um, I heard one congressman uh, on uh, one of the cable networks saying, a Republican congressman, a Trump supporter, saying he wants the president to say, call it off, to do more, to say more right now. So far, as this has unfolded, at first we heard, we saw a tweet from the president talking about how Mike Pence, the vice president, had let him down by not uh, doing something that was not within his power to do. But then he also has said we should support our law enforcement. But he has, Casey, to be clear, we haven't heard the president say to these protesters, stop, it's over, as this Republican congressman, Trump supporter, has said he wishes the president would do now. And you're absolutely right. And there are more Republicans who are saying that is exactly what needs to happen. Senator Marco Rubio uh, is saying that that is what it would mean to support law enforcement. Law enforcement have been uh, overrun here. Uh, and the reality is that this is supposed to be a formal uh, transfer of power from one administration to the next. And in fact, uh, Senator Mitch McConnell was on the floor of the Senate, someone who uh, critics you know, have said waited too long to criticize uh, President Trump. But even he this morning was saying, we have to believe these results. Uh, if we don't, then our democracy is going to begin uh, a decline. Uh, a death spiral was the phrase that he used. So that's how we started the day. And then just minutes later, this scene unfolds in the United States Capitol, which, uh, again, uh, I think it's important to, to realize most of these procedures are laid out in the Constitution. They yeah. are some of the oldest uh, things that govern how, how we govern ourselves, how we work as a democracy. It's certainly something that 
that I know many members of Congress who I talk to every day have taken great pride in being a part of that democracy. And right now we're seeing it halted by these people. Absolutely. Savannah. Casey, sorry to cut you off. I, I want to jump to a member of Congress, Brendan Boyle, who's a Democrat from Pennsylvania. I believe he's on the phone, Congressman. I mean, first of all, are you safe? Are you okay? Um, I, I don't expect you to tell us where you are, but um, what, what can you tell us about how you're doing right now? Yeah, well, thank you. I, I, I am uh, safe uh, myself and, and a few other younger staffers um, in, I'll just say, in my office, the building in, in which my office is located. Um, Capitol Police have been running through the hallway, so you'll occasionally hear a commotion outside, and I'm not sure whether or not it's Capitol Police or one of the, the protesters, um, and then just continuing to, to wait on further updates from the Capitol Police. And what did you witness today? What have you seen? Well, I've obviously never seen anything uh, like this before. And, you know, it wasn't a surprise that we were going to have um, this large crowd of, of protesters. So it's still a mystery to me how this crowd was able, within about 10 or 12 minutes of starting, able to breach both sides of the Capitol, both the east side and the west side, and get into or right around the House chamber as well as apparently from texts I'm getting from friends of mine who serve in the Senate, they were on the they were able to get into the Senate chamber as well. So th that is just uh, absolutely inexplicable, inexplicable to me that, that that this happened. But ultimately, though, the bigger threat, in my view, is, is not the thousands of people who are here today, even though they're armed and they are a threat. The bigger threat is actually those who have incited them all along the way, cheering this on. That's the real threat. Well, at this point, I, I, what are you hoping? How do you think this will be resolved? And do you think Congress will be able to complete its constitutional duty? I mean, it's even though there seems to be a moment right now of stasis, for lack of a better word, right now the, the Capitol is not under control. It's still infiltrated by people who have broken through barriers and broken across the, the lines um, to, to come over and come inside the Capitol. I mean, look at the image. I don't know if you can see it. We're seeing people inside offices, ceremonial offices and real working offices inside the Capitol who have barged in and having their way with the place. Uh, so assuming that this can be gotten under control, a law enforcement matter, would it be your hope that Congress reconvene today and try to complete its constitutional duty? Well, I, I immediately have two thoughts. The first is it's absolutely sickening to see this militia or armed mob bring us to the point of anarchy. Never in a thousand years did I ever think I would see this in the capital of the United States of America. But then my second thought is, I don't care how long I have to stay here. We are going to do our damn constitutional duty. There's no way I'm going to be chased off the capital of my own country by this mob and whoever is inciting them. Yes, we will do the people's duty. We will uh, ensure our constitutional process, come hell or high water, is followed, and that Joe Biden is inaugurated as president of the United States on the 20th of January. Well, Congressman Boyle, I appreciate your time this afternoon. Uh, stay safe, and you, and also all of the congressional staffers, a lot of young men and women who uh, work there yes. at the Capitol and are never seen. Um, I wish them well as, as, as well. Thank you for your time. Uh, Thank you. About quarter to four on the East Coast, as you can see, this uh, protest, whatever you want to call it, um, it's not a peaceful protest, as the demonstrators here have crossed barriers. They've crossed a line, and they are now uh, breaching the United States Capitol, forcing the Senate and House to evacuate and pause in the middle of a cherished and sacred constitutional duty having to do with the peaceful transfer of power. Um, debate is one thing. Protest is one thing. That's not what we're watching here, Lester, and we'll continue to keep our eye on it. No, absolutely. Uh, what, uh, we understand that now um, uh, from Tom Winter, one of our producers, one person in critical condition after being shot uh, at the Capitol. At least five people have been transported to hospitals, including um, 
several officers who were treated for pepper spray exposure for other people who've been transferred uh, from the Capitol as well. So we continue to watch uh, that, that play out. And we certainly saw pictures a moment ago, still pictures of uh, security uh, officials uh, with weapons drawn uh, uh, trying to barricade a door. So the situation is, is uh, extremely serious as, as it plays out right now. I want to go to Kristen Welker, uh, who is at the White House. Uh, Kristen, um, I'd say all eyes of the world are trained on the on the White House, but right now the Capitol is the focus, but uh, the answer uh, could come from the White House. Are we getting anything beyond the tweets the president issued? Is there, uh, is there a growing chorus of calls for him to try to put a stop to this? There is a growing chorus of calls. Lester, let me read you a tweet from Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany, a little bit of breaking news here. She says, at real Donald Trump's direction, the National Guard is on the way, along with other federal protective services. We reiterate President Trump's call against violence and to remain peaceful. So there you have it. The National Guard has been deployed to Washington, D.C., to the Capitol, to try to deal with uh, these protests that are unfolding uh, and this breach of the U.S. Capitol. Now, the messaging that we're getting from the White House, this is the latest from Vice President Mike Pence, who says the violence and destruction taking place at the U.S. Capitol must stop, and it must stop now. Anyone involved must respect law enforcement officers and immediately leave the building. Similar language from President Trump in a pair of tweets that he sent out earlier, Lester, but his supporters believe that that just does not go far enough, that they want to hear from President Trump himself, that they want him to come out and address his supporters and tell them Bottom line, stand down. Let me paint the scene for you at the White House right now, Lester. Uh, you have White House officials who are huddled in their offices, who are watching all of this unfold. I spoke with one official who told me that the president is watching this unfold as well. Of course, discussions about whether or not he is going to speak, whether there will be some type of written statement. But at this point, nothing on the horizon. So I think you are going to see the calls grow louder for him to come out and address these protesters, Lester. All right. Uh, thank you, Kristen. NBC News contributor and founder of Punchbowl News, Jake Sherman, joins us on the line. Jake, I understand you are in the Capitol. What can you see? What can you tell us? Well, I can see nothing at the moment, Lester, because we've been in lockdown. I'm just going to not say where because we, uh, we, uh, I want to protect our safety. But I've been covering this building for 11 years. Um, I've never obviously seen anything like this. I usually can't get through uh, security with my AirPods or my belt, and these people have broken down doors. This is a, this is a mob. This is not a protest. This is, a, this is an armed mob, and uh, this is despicable and really, really, really unsafe, and we're all very scared. Did you, uh, have you, I know you're in lockdown right now, but have you heard any of the protesters nearby? Oh, yeah. When, yes. When I was, I was at the beginning of the protest, I walked outside to see what was going on and walked past uh, a floor up. I was standing elevated and people were breaking down the windows to very, very large and very secure doors. Uh, uh, they had a flagpole and they were knocking through windows. We've heard banging on our doors. We saw SWAT teams with long guns walking through the building. I fortunately was not in the chamber. All of my colleagues and members of Congress who were in the chamber were taken out. We, st we still, where I am right now, have not been evacuated from the Capitol building, uh, but hope to be soon, frankly, because, uh, <laughs> you know, we don't have security like many members of Congress do. Yeah. All right, Jake, uh, uh, stay safe, and we do hope uh, we'll get you out of there as soon as possible. Uh, Savannah. Uh, hi, Lester. I want to bring in Senator Tammy Duckworth, who, uh, of course, is a veteran herself, a wounded veteran, I might add. Uh, Senator Duckworth, were you on the Senate floor when, when this happened? How are you doing? Are you safe? I am safe. I am uh, uh, barricaded in a, superior lo in a secure location. I was actually on my way to the Senate floor in the tunnels um, underneath the Capitol when the um, uh, Capitol Police turned me around and uh, took had me go to a secure location. So I am safe with um, uh, a couple of my staff members. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've defended our Constitution for 23 years uh, in their service and, and now um, for eight years here on, on the Capitol Hill. And I've never, uh, in my wildest dreams, would I ever think that um, Americans would do this to our own nation's capital.
I mean, I'm sure you are seeing the images I'm seeing, the United States Senate, the floor of the United States Senate, uh, at the Congress being uh, taken over by people who have breached barricades, who've gone past police, who are where they are not permitted to be. Um, have you gotten any kind of communication? Um, I, I, I don't imagine all 100 senators are on a text chain, but have you heard anything from the leadership about the plan to get this back under control and what might happen in terms of the constitutional duty that Congress has today? I am not, uh, I've not heard anything directly from the uh, Republican leader's uh, office. Um, I am getting information from my leadership team uh, who are uh, following up on every one of us and where we are located, all the Democrats and, and those who caucus with us. Um, and, you know, again, listen, I, 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 my entire adult life had defended people's rights to protest. And peaceful protest is something that I absolutely support. But this is a mob. This is a riot. These are people who are not practicing democracy. In fact, they are, you know, doing the will of a wannabe tin pot dictator who lost the election. And, and this is no way for us to be uh, running our country and, and, and really doing the work that needs to be done, which is fight a global pandemic and get working families back up on their feet again. Senator, you, I mean, you're as tough as they come. As I mentioned, you are a, a, a wounded veteran who served our country, but was there any moment today when you were on your way to the Capitol and you were turned around in, in a rush? I mean, what went through your mind? Did you feel uh, fear or concern or anxiety about your own safety? You know, I, I don't. Um, I, I did not feel fear or, or concern. I, I, I did what the Capitol Police asked you to do, because um, that is the best thing to do, is just to follow their direction um, and to take myself out of the equation so that I would be one less person they would have to worry about and that they could concentrate on their job and, and, and focus on those who were breaching the Capitol. Um, I will tell you this. These protesters will not stop me from carrying out my duties uh, as have been laid out for me in the Constitution. And if we have to be here all night and all day tomorrow and the next day, we will continue to carry out uh, the work that needs to be done. And I'm not going to be deterred uh, from standing my ground. You know, I will not quit my post. I will be here and I will do the people's business. Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois, thank you for calling in. Stay safe. Keep us posted. We'll stay in touch with you. Okay. Appreciate it. Lester, over to you. Uh, thanks. I want to bring in Hallie Jackson right now, Savannah, who is, uh, uh, of course, our chief White House correspondent. Hallie, uh, you know, the president spoke to this crowd today. Uh, so much of what we've been hearing, of course, is that is that the inauguration will go on on, on the 20th. Are there concerns that what's happening today could obviously can't move that date, but could have a, a tremendous effect on how we mark that day? You can't imagine, Lester, that it's not going to, right, or at least have a discussion or a conversation about that, given what we're seeing unfolding. I think to give people some perspective here, um, and, and remember, in inaugurations past, this is what happens. You have typically uh, the president-elect on the west front of the Capitol. You have that sort of parade down Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House. Things had been changing and in flux very much anyway because of the pandemic. And by the way, it's a pandemic that is still very much happening and very much active currently. Uh, and the question now is, will this change even more on Inauguration Day, given the scene here, given the security and the safety perspective? One of the things that you have talked about, Lester, as you see these images, you, do, you, you said earlier you might feel sort of sick looking at that. Uh, it is stunning, I think, to people in this country, as well as to people in the international community, the head of NATO. Uh, the NATO Secretary General calling these shocking scenes in Washington and saying the outcome of this democratic election must be respected. Lester, that is the kind of sentence that you hear aimed at other countries, not the United States, that you haven't ever heard aimed at the United States. To give you some perspective of the way that this is being seen uh, and the way that it is being perceived and happening uh, here in the United States and around the world as well. As far, the pre as, far as the president goes, uh, another one of his allies, um, his Again, more and more of his allies coming out now saying he needs to appear. There was a mention perhaps of, and we heard earlier some reporting, question marks, excuse me, um, as our studios are kind of going off here, I'm just going to hang this phone up, question marks on whether the president would deliver, for example, a written statement, a speech. A written statement isn't going to cut it at this point. And frankly, Lester, I think there is also a fair question of whether a formal deliverance of remarks from President Trump is enough to 
stop what's happening here, to get these uh, rioters, frankly, to turn around uh, and leave the Capitol. We know now, based on the reporting uh, from our teams, that the National Guard and the press secretary has confirmed that the National Guard is coming in. You have other states now, uh, neighboring states here, Maryland, Virginia, sending in the National Guard as well. The change of mission has been approved, as you see on the screen. Um, I think it is also important to note, as we talk about the process, uh, Congressman Brendan Boyle of Pennsylvania saying, we are absolutely going to get this work done. Logistically, Lester, that is going to be almost impossible to do anytime in the immediate term future because of this unbelievable security breach that has happened. You cannot send members of Congress back into a House chamber that hasn't been swept. You can't send members of Congress back into offices where people who have not been screened are there, you know, putting, not just putting their feet up on the table, but doing, you know, you just don't know. And that is an enormous security breach as now we see this uh, remarkable scene of this line of cars, uh, police vehicles, law enforcement vehicles, lights and sirens on coming down. I, I can't quite get my bearings from this chopper shot here as to which angle we're looking at, north or south. Um, but this is obviously the main drag here heading into the Capitol on the mall. The backup is coming. That seems to be what's happening here. And it is desperately needed at this moment because you still have to get these protesters yeah. cleared out if you're law enforcement. OK, and I see that. I see the perspective there, Lester. Yeah, and of course, a, a 6 p.m. curfew is is now looming as we watch uh, more security descend uh, on the Capitol, uh, preparing for whatever may come. And we should also note, before I hand it back over to uh, Savannah, those pictures we've been seeing of people occupying offices and parts of the Capitol, those pictures are shocking, but it should also be noted they are potential evidence as well. Savannah? No question about that uh, for a later time, but right now we're still in the middle of it. This capital not under uh, control, but in fact overrun by uh, a group, a mob of people. Um, let me get to Pete Williams. I think he's got some reporting on the law enforcement efforts here. Pete, what, what is the, uh, the plan here or what, what is beginning to be a plan? Well, uh, we know now that the FBI has been deployed uh, at the request of Capitol Police to help. We know that Homeland Security is sending people, uh, Homeland Security Investigations, presumably. Uh, obviously, you've got Metro uh, Police from the D.C., um, uh, the police department here, the local police department, in addition to the Capitol Police. We know that they've assisted, asked for assistance from the National Guard. So they won't lack for, they won't, <laughs> at some point later, lack for manpower to empty out the Capitol. And that's obviously the immediate chore here, is to get the Capitol emptied out, secured. Uh, they've got to go through all these spaces and, and make sure that they're swept and secure and that nobody else is hiding out in, inside the building. Uh, you're looking at the at now at the house side of the of the Capitol uh, complex. That's Independence Avenue, where uh, traffic is being restricted. Police are using that as a sort of a staging area. Uh, and then you see the Capitol come into the view. That's the House chamber on your left, uh, then the, the center, the rotunda, and that little sort of square section between the House and the rotunda. Uh, inside there is st Statuary Hall under that curved uh, dome with the little cupola on top. Under that is Statuary Hall. That's the old house chamber. And that's where you saw those dramatic pictures today of people streaming from the rotunda toward the house chamber, which is the, the, what now is just disappearing on the left side of the screen. And then the center part of the Capitol, and then on the right would be the, the Senate chamber. Obviously, uh, that is the concern now to get things squared away so that the counting can resume. You were talking about this earlier, uh, Savannah. Un by law, by the Electoral Counting Act, it has to start today, but there's no limit in how long it takes. They'll, they'll keep going until they're done. Uh, and if they're not done by Inauguration Day, and I have no reason to think that they won't be, but if they're not, then there's procedures to have, uh, you know, there's, there's the Succession Act. The Speaker would become president temporarily until they can figure out who the president is, but which obviously will be, will be Joe Biden. Now, on the law enforcement side, we've noted that one person was shot inside the U.S. Capitol by someone from law enforcement, not sure which agency that was. We've been told by law enforcement authorities that at least one improvised explosive device was found on the Capitol grounds, not inside a building, but on the Capitol grounds, and possibly a second item. We know that law enforcement people are looking at that earlier this afternoon. Before we saw people storming the Capitol, the big concern was evacuation of the Library of Congress, which is yeah. directly across the street from the Capitol, and uh, a portion of a House office building.
And Pete, um, I, in case we have not caught up on this note, Kaylee McEnany, the press secretary for the White House, said that the National Guard is on the way along with other federal protective services. And she says, we reiterate President Trump's call against violence and to remain peaceful, but we have not heard from the president, not recently, not uh, not within the last few moments, asking uh, folks who are gathered there at the, at the Capitol to call it off and to stop. Let me go to Casey Hunt. Casey, um, obviously, first question is always what it, what it's, what's happening there behind you, but also I know we've heard from the Democratic leaders of the House and Senate now. We have, Savannah, and they are calling uh, for the president to do just what you said he has not yet done, which is uh, to leave demand that all protesters leave the U.S. Capitol and Capitol grounds immediately. That is a joint statement from the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the minority leader in the Senate, uh, Chuck Schumer. Now, I can also tell you, Savannah, that what has started today as fear, chaos, uncertainty about what was going on is hardening into resolve and determination to get the government back on track. So one member who is at the secure location where they've taken members of the House tells me that one Democrat and one Republican, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, the Democrat, Liz Cheney, the Republican, informed those members on lockdown that the National Guard is on the way. There was applause in the room, and this member uh, said to me that we will return to the floor and do our jobs, uh, was the quote. I also heard from a member of the Senate who was also taken to the Senate side secure location. Uh, this member is safe. Uh, this member also told me uh, that these thugs uh, will not uh, win the day, essentially, that they are prepared uh, to go back onto the Senate floor. Uh, Senator Joe Manchin telling me we're all okay and ready to get back to our chamber and finish our work. These thugs cannot and will not run us off. We will continue to Casey. govern. And I, uh, yes, Savannah. Oh, I just wanted, I wanted to try to understand because, you know, we just talked to Senator Doug Duckworth, it sounded like she was in her office. You know, everybody wasn't, all 535 members of Congress weren't all there at the same time. But are there various locations where there are groups of senators or groups of congressmen sheltering together? Did I catch that? Yes, yes, that's right. So it's it's a little bit complicated, and it depends on where you were when this started to unfold. So we saw the joint session begin this process, then the House and the Senate separated to their respective chambers, and they started debating this question. And it was during that point that protesters breached the Capitol, and they eventually, of course, breached the floor of the House and the floor of the Senate. So because of coronavirus, not everyone is allowed in the chambers at the same time. Normally, of course, there are 435 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate. All of them have a chair or a desk. But with social distancing, you can't do that. So that means that groups of members were scattered in different places when this all unfolded. Many of the senators had just processed back across the Capitol. They had started their debate in the Senate chamber. So there was a, I would say, a, a higher proportion of the chamber was present over on the Senate side. And then you also had a bunch of, of House members still on the floor of the House. And as it unfolded, and we had um, the video, in fact, that you're watching right now is from Haley Talbot, who's our producer, who was inside the chamber uh, as this was unfolding. She was with some members who were up there in the gallery. That's the level that's above the House floor as this was all, as they were all being evacuated. So many of those members were taken together in a group to a different location in the Capitol complex. Um, we happen to know where this one is, but we're not reporting it because obviously there are many security concerns about that. The Senate, meanwhile, had a similar situation. There were members on the floor who were evacuated together. So those members are also telling me, I've talked to a couple of them, I know they're in the same place. We don't know where they are, but we do know uh, that they are safe and that a number of them are together. Mm. Then, of course, if you were a member who was not on the floor and not part of that escort uh, from Capitol Police, you may be at uh, any other uh, place, your, your office building, uh, your uh, your own personal office. So yep. that's kind of how these things are, Casey, are set up here. Savannah. Got it. Casey, got to jump. Let's listen to the President-elect Joe Biden. Delayed coming out to speak to you. I initially was going to talk about the economy, but all of you, all of you have been watching what I've been watching. At this hour, our democracy is under an unprecedented assault, unlike anything we've seen in modern times. An assault on the Citadel of Liberty, the Capitol itself. An assault on the people's representatives and the Capitol Hill police 
sworn to protect them and the public servants who work at the heart of our republic. An assault on the rule of law like few times we've ever seen it. An assault on the most sacred of American undertakings, the doing of the people's business. Let me be very clear. The scenes of chaos at the Capitol do not reflect a true America, do not represent who we are. What we're seeing are a small number of extremists dedicated to lawlessness. This is not dissent. It's disorder. It's chaos. It borders on sedition. And it must end now. I call on this mob to pull back and allow the work of democracy to go forward. You've heard me say before in different contexts, the words of a president matter, no matter how good or bad that president is. At their best, the words of a president can inspire. At their worst, they can incite. And therefore, I call on President Trump to go on national television now to fulfill his oath, long the beacon of light and hope for democracy has come to such a dark moment. Through war and strife, America's endured much. And we will endure here and we will prevail again and will prevail now. The work of the moment and the work of the next four years must be the restoration of democracy, of decency, honor, respect, the rule of law, just plain, simple decency, the renewal of the politics. It's about solving problems, looking out for one another, not stoking the flames of hate and chaos. As I said, America is about honor, decency, respect, tolerance. That's who we are. That's who we've always been. The certification of the Electoral College vote is supposed to be a sacred ritual, which we affirm purpose is to affirm the majesty of American democracy. But today's reminder, a painful one, that democracy is fragile, and to preserve it requires people of goodwill, leaders who have the courage to stand up, who are devoted not to the pursuit of power, or the personal interest pursuits of their own selfish interest at any cost, but of the common good. Think what our children watching television is thinking. Think what the rest of the world is looking at. For nearly two and a half centuries, we, the people, in search of a more perfect union, have kept our eyes on that common good. America is so much better than what we've seen today. Watching the scenes from the Capitol, I was reminded as I prepared other speeches in the past, I was reminded of the words of Abraham Lincoln in his annual message to Congress, whose work has today been interrupted by chaos. Here's what Lincoln said. He said, we shall nobly save or merely lose the last best hope on earth. Went on to say, the way is plain, peaceful, generous, just. A way which if followed, the world will forever applaud and God must forever bless. The way is plain here too. That's who we are. It's the way of democracy, of respect, of decency, of honor. 
and commitment as patriots to this nation. Notwithstanding what I saw today and we're seeing today, I remain optimistic about the incredible opportunities. There has never been anything we can't do when we do it together. And this God awful display today is bringing home to every Republican and Democrat and independent in the nation that we must step up. This is the United States of America. There's never, ever, 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 ever been a thing we've tried to do that we've done it together. We've not been able to do it. So President Trump, step up. May God bless America. And may God protect our troops and all those folks at the Capitol who are trying to preserve order. Thank you, and I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. We've seen today, sir. President-elect Joe Biden asking, calling on President Trump to step up, calling what's hap happening at the Capitol right now uh, uh, a uh, democracy under assault, and calling on the president to go on national TV to call for an end of the violence we've seen in and outside the U.S. Capitol tonight. An extraordinary moment. Uh, Joe Biden actually making a few comments. Okay, as he departs the stage, enough is enough is enough. Uh, Joe Biden, who has at times during this period leading up to his inauguration played the de facto um, uh, healer in, in chief, uh, once again, taking that role under under circumstances that probably even he couldn't have imagined uh, what we're seeing today, supporters of the president who have stormed the U.S. Capitol, who have desecrated uh, parts of the, of the Capitol. We've seen it in a, in a series of photos. Uh, just before we went uh, to the president-elect, we should note uh, some other major news taking place uh, somewhat related to all this. Uh, NBC News uh, now projecting that John Ossoff, the Democrat, uh, will win the Senate runoff in the state of Georgia. And that uh, leads to the projection that Democrats will regain control of the U.S. Senate. It'll be a 50-50 split. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, Vice President-elect, uh, as Vice President, will have the tying, uh, the uh, tie-breaking vote. So that just breaking here a few moments ago before we went uh, to Joe Biden. Let's go back to uh, Hallie Jackson right now, who can uh, give us some more insight as to what is happening there in Washington as the, uh, the light begins to dim. As it begins to get dark here, Lester, I can tell you that it appears we are going to be hearing from President Trump at some point in the coming hours. I am told uh, just moments ago by a senior administration official that the president will have a taped message coming shortly. Uh, presumably, of course, one would imagine, to address the chaotic, difficult, mob-like scene that we have seen at the Capitol outside and inside as we're playing now some of that video from earlier of the protesters storming the steps. We still do not know. I have no clarity on remarks, for example, the content of those, what specifically the president might say. But you have to remember, he has had people close to him, people uh, who are his Republican allies publicly now call on him to do something, not just Joe Biden, right, not just what we heard from the president-elect, who is ending his remarks and very clearly saying, time to step up, President Trump. Uh, it appears we will hear something from the president. Of course, Lester, this could go in various directions, right? Presumably, you have to think that the president will, in fact, call on these now rioters to stop, to, to abandon this this so-called mission to turn around and to leave, particularly now as we are coming within just, what, an hour and 45 minutes of this curfew happening. Uh, so, so that's one piece of it. But Lester, this is also a president who, over the last two weeks, it can be said, fairly and objectively, has worked to spread misinformation repeatedly about the election's results, repeatedly calling on his own vice president to try to in my words here, mess with the results of this electoral college vote count. The vice president does not have the authority to do that. The president has repeatedly insisted he has won states, specifically, for example, Georgia, that he did not win in this election. The president has repeatedly insisted that he is, in fact, the person who should legitimately uh, be inaugurated, take office, continue to keep office after January 20th. 
that is not accurate. That's not true. That's not correct. That's not what's happening. The president may have a platform here uh, with the world watching him to continue to make those false uh, and misleading and inaccurate and troubling claims. We talk about the world watching, Lester. Uh, I have to tell you, Boris Johnson, the, the prime minister of the UK, is reacting to this as well, calling w what you're seeing on the screen now disgraceful scenes in the United States. He's continuing that the U.S. stands for democracy around the world. It is now vital that there should be a peaceful and orderly transfer of power. You now have international allies of the president calling on, uh, calling on the president to give up the fight, basically, to give up the game, to say that it is over. And, Lester, I think that is p perhaps the only thing that is going to get these people out of the Capitol. And I have to tell you, I'm not even sure that that is 100 percent going to do it here. Time is of the essence. Uh, and so we will, of course, be watching to see when that message, again, as I'm being told by, by a source familiar with that message, will be taped and will be coming out soon, Lester. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you've covered this president for a long time, and he doesn't retreat. He, he doesn't he doesn't give ground. No. And so that makes you wonder, is this a case, Hallie, be careful what you wish for? Could he perhaps inflame the situation any further? We've all been through those circumstances where, you know, he's about to make live statements and, and we have to be very careful what we what we hear because of his propensity to uh, to tell untruths. And I think that's that's the point here, Lester. Right. And I do think I had it in my head as I was watching President elect Biden's speech, basically you know, throwing down and saying, Mr. President, you need to address the nation. Uh, I do think, based on President Trump's past patterns, it is possible that there could have been an entrenchment for the president. He is somebody who can fairly be called a defiant leader, defiant even in the face uh, of what seems to be the logical and the correct thing to do in a, in a political situation, much less a national security situation as we are seeing now. And I have to tell you, the shot that we're looking at uh, that's, that's coming in, Stunning. I, th I believe that that is the area where the, the press goes down uh, onto the where the Senate chambers are. Um, it looks like that is the workspace with people. It looks like National Guard's officers uh, in there, at least some sort of law enforcement officers with long guns. It is a disturbing sight. Uh, but I think you're right, Lester. I think that the president is going to use this platform for something. Right. The something is still a question mark. Yeah, Hallie, thank you. Uh, let me turn it back over to Savannah. Well, let's bring everybody up to date. It's 20 minutes after 4 o'clock here on the East Coast, and what you're witnessing is, I think, fair to say, unprecedented throngs of protesters turned mob coming and breaching the United States Capitol at the very moment it was performing a sacred constitutional duty certifying the Electoral College in order to implement the peaceful transfer of power in our democracy. We've just heard from the Vice President, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, President-elect, who will take office in two weeks. He said, democracy is fragile. And we're seeing that today. And he called directly on President Trump to get on ca on camera, to get on television, and ask his supporters to call it off, to stop, to give up the game, and to retreat peacefully from the Capitol. As a law enforcement matter, we have not seen the Capitol Police or any of the other law enforcement agencies who have been called in to assist them come in in an aggressive way trying to clear these protests. Uh, whether they should or shouldn't is probably something that is a matter of debate right now. As we speak, members of the Senate and House there in Washington have been told to shelter in place wherever they are, whether it be their offices or in the matter of those who were on the Senate floor or on the House floor when this took place, when those demonstrators breached the Capitol, were taken to a secure location, uh, which we cannot reveal. Um, some of them are together. And in fact, um, uh, we have reporting that uh, those senators, the group of senators who were together, watched the president-elect Joe Biden's speech together. We also have been informed by uh, one of our reporters on the scene, Kelly O'Donnell, that Vice President Pence is still at the Capitol because it is simply not safe for him to return to the White House. That is the situation in Washington right now. One woman has been shot. Uh, it appears to be a protester that the shot uh, reportedly was from law enforcement. She has been taken to the hospital. We don't have an update on her condition. Um, and, and that will bring you up to date. Uh, also, an IED, that's an improvised explosive device, according to NBC News, was recovered on the Capitol grounds. Let me get to Congresswoman Liz Cheney, Republican from Wyoming. Uh, Congresswoman, you, of course, were an outspoken opponent 
of the tactics that we saw in terms of the politics, whether the electoral college vote should be objected to. So you were one who said, it's time now, the election is over, and it's time to perform our constitutional duty. So just so we know where you stand on this. But let's just get to what happened today. Where were you? What did you see? And how are you? Uh, fine, Savannah. Um, I'm not going to talk about where we are, but we were on the floor of the House of Representatives um, uh, performing our constitutional duty to count the electoral votes uh, when uh, we had to be evacuated. And um, we are uh, you know, in a place with, with bipartisan um, group of members, and uh, my, my Democratic counterpart, Hakeem Jeffries, and I um, have both um, made clear that uh, we, we do not intend to allow um, this kind of mob violence to stop us from carrying out our constitutional duty. Well, our, um, insti so our institutions have got to be defended and protected. We have an oath to the Constitution. Um, uh, the, you know, sending uh, an angry, violent mob to disrupt proceedings at the Capitol uh, cannot, cannot stand. When you say um, sending sending a mob, who do you believe is responsible? Who sent the mob? Look, the President of the United States uh, called his supporters to Washington, D.C., and has dispatched them, uh, you know, uh, without telling them to stop it. Now, I believe he has spoken out uh, in the last few minutes, possibly. But, it, you know, we, we live in a, in a republic that is governed by the rule of law and by our Constitution. And... Uh, this, this cannot stand, and it won't stand. We will carry out our constitutional obligation. We'll count the electoral votes, uh, and, and we all need to remember. We all need to come together. This that, that the the republic, the future of the republic, depends upon Americans standing as one, um, abiding by the Constitution of the United States. We, we do not uh, bend to mob rule. We don't bend to political threat. There comes a time when. Uh, our elections are over, and we have to carry out our constitutional duty. And, and you know, that's the moment that, uh, that we have arrived at now, and we're going to continue to do that. Congresswoman, I'm sure, like all of us, you're looking at these images. I mean, the one we have on right now, somebody sitting <laughs> in the chair of where the, the Senate president presides over the United States Senate, and here's some protester sitting there. Now we've got another shot of some protester sitting in an office uh, with his feet up, literally with his feet up. This is the United States Capitol. This is sacred ground in our democracy. What what goes through your mind when you see these images? Well, um, it is infuriating and it is uh, it's heartbreaking, uh, and uh, it, it it will not stand. You know, we we are um, uh, a democratic republic. We have uh, survived uh, for you know over 240 years uh, and we have had the peaceful transfer of power the peaceful transfer of power is something that you know Ronald Reagan talked about that that in some instances we take for granted but it is miraculous and I think that what we've seen today is um, that that it, it is something that is very fragile but that we all must stand for it the president should immediately, uh, make clear that this kind of activity, of violent activity at the Capitol, um, has to stop. Uh, and he ought to make clear that, uh, you know, he will abide by the results of the uh, Electoral College vote um, and uh, that he will uh, ensure the peaceful transition of power. Are you, and there will be plenty of time to analyze this later, but just in the moment, as you sit there, sheltered in place, locked down with fellow members of Congress, are you disturbed that this was able to happen at all? That security was such that a group of protesters turned mob could come in and breach the United States Capitol? It isn't as though this wasn't advertised. I mean, <laughs> this has been boiling and being planned for days and weeks. Yes, I mean, it, it, it obviously uh, is um, a, a terrible day in the history of the Republic, but I think what's important to make clear is that we, we are strong, we're resilient, and we have bipartisan dedication and commitment uh, to, to protecting and defending the rule yeah. of law and, and to protecting and upholding our oath to the Constitution. And Congresswoman, forgive me for interrupting, but the President has tweeted, uh, well, I, now I'm told he, he didn't, he's about to tweet a video statement. Now, um, he had been urged by 
members of the Republican caucus, including senators and members such as yourself, to say something. I think they're telling me we've got this video statement from the president. Can we roll it? Let's go. I know you're pain. I know you're hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us. It was a landslide election, and everyone knows it, especially the other side. But you have to go home now. We have to have peace. We have to have law and order. We have to respect our great people in law and order. We don't want anybody hurt. It's a very tough period of time. There's never been a time like this where such a thing happened, where they could take it away from all of us, from me, from you, from our country. This was a fraudulent election, but we can't play into the hands of these people. We have to have peace. So go home. We love you. You're very special. You've seen what happens. You see the way others are treated that are so bad and so evil. I know how you feel. But go home and go home in peace. Well, that was the statement from the president released via Twitter. Congressman Cheney, I think you're still with me. I mean, here you are. You're on lockdown. Was that good enough for you? He's telling folks, this was stolen from you. This was awful, but go home now. Do you think that was the kind of statement that will get the job done? Look, the, the president of the United States um, should have, before now, made clear that he wasn't going to countenance uh, any kind of, of uh, attack or violent activity like this. And, uh, I, you know, it is, it is good that he has asked people to go home, but what has happened today is unprecedented in American history. And when you have violent mobs storming the floor of the House of Representatives and the floor of the United States Senate, and the president's response is to say that he loves those people, um, you know, it, 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 is, uh, it, it, it is absolutely um, counter to uh, the Constitution. Um, and, and counter to the peaceful transition of power and the values on which this republic was built. We have but, oaths that we have taken the Constitution, and we got to uphold those oaths. And, but, uh, but you know. and Congresswoman, I mean, even more than that, I mean, yes, I, I hear what you're saying, but is it sort of, is it going to get the job done? In other words, is he talking out of both sides of his mouth? He's saying, go home, but you were robbed. You, were, you have every right to be angry. This was a fraud. This was stolen. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> he's doing two things at once. And the goal here, I think, of the statement, I think what those of you in lockdown right now who would like to get about your business and go on with your day, it, is, there's one goal, which is get this thing under control and get the mob out of there. Look, I, I, there, there's no question about that, Savannah. You know, we have very deep and, and clear political differences in this country, but we don't resolve those differences by mob violence. And it doesn't matter what side of those issues you stand on. Um, the President of the United States statement now, uh, in my view, was completely inadequate. What he has done and what he has caused here um, is something that we've never seen before in our history. Um, you know, it's been 245 years. Um, and no president has ever failed to concede uh, or agree to leave office after the Electoral College has voted. And I think what we are seeing today is a result of that, a result of convincing people that somehow uh, Congress was going to overturn the results of this election, uh, a result of, of suggesting that he wouldn't leave office. Uh, those are very, very dangerous things. And uh, he, he you know, will be uh, remembered. This will be part of his legacy, and it is a dangerous moment for the country. Uh, Congresswoman Liz Cheney of Wyoming, stay safe, keep us posted, uh, and thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. 4.30 uh, on the East Coast here as we watch what's unfolding at the Capitol. Lester, I'll send it to you. Yeah, Savannah, I want to bring in Andrea Mitchell right now. Andrea, your thoughts on what we heard in that video tweet from the president, as is often the case with him, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't retreat. Did he pour water or gasoline on this fire? I think he poured gasoline on this fire, a fire that he himself set. His former communications director hours ago, Alyssa Farah, uh, tweeted, you need to condemn this. That was hardly a condemnation. He said, I love you. He again said that the election was stolen, that it was fraudulent. He repeated all of these lies, and then he says, I love you, and go home peacefully. Um, that's hardly going to get these people <laughs> That's not a condemnation. It's not going to get them out of a building that they barge into. They are an unruly mob. Weapons have been found. Uh, at least one or two shots were fired. 
people have been injured. They've stopped the democratic process. Um, you know, Lester, I worked up there for years. I know those corridors in that building and love that institution, the House and the Senate, as flawed as it is, as gridlocked as it has been, as much as we criticize it. But for the process of democracy, of counting the electoral votes to be stopped in, in its tracks and for people to be hiding under their desks and grabbing their gas masks uh, on the floor of the House and in the Senate, and for the people, for the vice president and the, the people in succession, for continuity of government to be taken by Secret Service and Capitol Pol Police out and put in secure locations for their safety is simply shocking. I am as shocked as any other citizen who loves our country and loves democracy, and especially someone who knows the people up there and has worked with them and our own colleagues up there. I just want to say the irony, the irony. Um, here's a statement from the Speaker of the Grand National Assembly of Turkey, a government that is, you know, a, just run by a dictator where people are jailed, journalists and, and, and people who are democratic protesters. We follow the events in the USA with concern and invite the parties to calmness, the speaker writes on Twitter. We believe that problems will always be solved within law and democracy. As Turkey, we have always been in favor of the law and democracy, and we recommend it to everyone. Uh, this is just a continuation of a government run by this president, his secretary of state, who have embraced dictators, ignored human rights, ignored the jailings of protesters, women and others who've been tortured in jail in Saudi Arabia. And now we see mob rule in the capital of the United States. It is beyond shocking. Uh, Andrea Mitchell. Andrea, thanks very much. Uh, we are about 90 minutes uh, from the uh, curfew that will go into effect at 6 p.m. Eastern time in Washington, D.C. The light already beginning to fade there as uh, there seems to be no break in the in where we are in terms of what we've been seeing on the uh, the front sides of the, of the, the Capitol. Uh, no movement to for people to leave or to remove them. Um, and at the same time, there is still business for this Congress to do uh, to exercise and fulfill its duty to uh, count the electoral vote and, um, and essentially confirm this election. I am going to uh, begin preparing for NBC Nightly News. It'll be going on there in a few hours. I'll leave it in the capable hands of Savannah Guthrie, but our NBC News coverage will continue. Savannah, we'll send it to you, and we'll see you in a bit later. All right, we'll see you on Nightly, Lester. Um, a couple of developments. The FBI SWAT team has now entered the Capitol complex, and our reporter on the Hill, Leanne Caldwell, has tweeted some video of that. So there seems to be some movement on the part of law enforcement to start to get this thing under control. Lester mentioned the 6 o'clock curfew. Uh, so while we're talking about law enforcement, let me get to Pete Williams. Pete, bring us up to date, because the governor of Virginia said that a request had come in for the National Guard of Virginia to come in and help. We know the FBI is on the scene. What do you know about what law enforcement is there, what's being brought to bear, and, and what the, the plan is here? Because it does seem like we've been in this state of suspended animation uh, where you know, members of the House and Senate are in lockdown, but yet this situation is definitely not under control. Right. So the, the Senate and House members are safe and secure. We're understanding is the vice president, the president of the Senate, is still actually in the Capitol complex because it wasn't considered safe to get him out of there yet. So uh, they're all hunkered down in, in secure locations. Uh, as more law enforcement agencies start to come in now, obviously job one will be to get the place emptied out, get everybody out of there. And then job two will be to start looking through the, the, the building, making sure that everyone's gone, that all places are safe. Uh, uh, you know, they'll have, to, they'll have to sweep the rooms and make sure that there's uh, nothing left behind. Two improvised explosive devices were found not in the Capitol, but on the Capitol grounds, like pipe bomb-looking devices. They're being disrupted. We don't know whether they're actually working or hoax devices, but they're simply destroying them. Uh, so for those reasons, it's going to take a while. And I just talked to a member of the Senate leadership to say, what are you going to do? Are you you're going to wait until it's safe to go back into the House chamber? Well, that could be 24 hours. And the answer was, 
and this is being discussed right now on the leadership of both sides, my understanding is, the, the sentiment up there right now is we're not leaving. We're going to stay here and do our jobs, even if it means doing it from the two secure locations. We know what they are, but we're not reporting them for obvious reasons, where the House members and Senate senators are. Uh, so there's, at least right now, the feeling up there is, let's keep going. Uh, now, the Constitution Well, that's interesting. Say, Wait, Pete, so you're saying, I, I just want to make sure I'm catching that, because that's, I yep. mean, some of these senators are together, presumably a, enough for a quorum, since these were the senators who were on the floor. You're saying they might want to just keep it going before this is even under control? They're just going to keep going? Yes, or, wow. or at least some point, some point soon. In other words, in, in other words, not wait until the Capitol Police get the whole place cleared out, the whole Capitol swept, and declare it safe for the two chambers to come, you know, to be in operation again. Because that could take, as I say, 24 to 48 hours, I suppose 24 hours, uh, to get that, you know, get the House and Senate floor ready for people to come back. Uh, but the senators right now, they're because what I, what I asked this member of the leadership is, what are you going to do? You're going to go home and come back tomorrow? And the feeling was, no, we're going to keep, we're going to stay right here and, and resume our work. Now, I started to say, there's no requirement in the Constitution for where they do this. It just says uh, that they shall, it, it shall be in the presence of the Senate and the House, so the counting. So it could be anywhere. Now, there is a federal lo a law, the Electoral Count Act, that says that it has to be in the House chamber, but they're, you know, exploring ways around that, that, that statutory requirement. It's not in the Constitution. So all I can tell you is that right now there's a, a feeling of let's not leave. I, it's, I would describe it as sort of defiance, that yeah. we will not be cowed by this outrageous intrusion into the Capitol. They're, they're determined to keep going. And uh, the person I was talking to said when this was suggested in this group of senators that are in the secure location, there was applause. Wow. Well, that's a fascinating reporting from inside. It just don't, wouldn't you like to be a fly on the wall to see what's happening? Because in that area, in that secure location, our senators who, of course, are on both sides of this this issue of whether the electoral college vote should have been objected to at all and here they are all together because of this mob that descended on the capitol so uh and we've heard that sentiment from some of the members that we've talked to on the phone p saying you know if i have to be here all night we, we want to get yes. this done this is our constitutional duty we heard tammy duckworth a decorated u.s veteran who lost her legs in combat saying nothing will stop me from performing my constitutional duties but your reporting is pretty extraordinary pete that they are even considering doing it right where they sit, uh, not right. waiting to, for the Capitol to be clear that uh, that they seem quite determined to do so. Stand by there, Pete. Right. Keep us posted. Casey, over to you on the Hill. I know you're plugged in. You're our Capitol Hill correspondent. What are you hearing uh, in terms of the security, but also in terms of what the plan is now for uh, the business of the Congress? Well, Savannah, I'm hearing a sentiment similar to what Pete was just reporting out here, that what had started off today as chaos, some fear, uncertainty, is moving into resolve, uh, an insistence. Uh, Joe Manchin told me to not let these thugs uh, take over, that they are going to return uh, to their work. And there are some logistical questions about that, but remember, there are contingency plans for things like this. I mean, we've never necessarily imagined this exact scenario, but in the wake of September 11th, they had to, of course, evacuate okay. members of Congress. And okay. there are a couple of locations in this we'll complex from, like, uh, where okay. potentially, um, where potentially, um, and Savannah, I, I'm not sure I, I can hear you in my ER viewers. Oh, maybe, sorry, maybe that was me. You as well. <laughs> Casey, I'm sorry, that was our, me talking to the producer. Uh, sorry, yeah, carry no, on. I apologize. No, no, of course. Um, so there is an auditorium in an in a newly built area of the Capitol complex that is large enough uh, to hold uh, people. And again, I want to be careful how I describe things because we are, of course, worried about the, the security situation. But there are contingencies uh, for the House and the Senate to operate in rooms that are different from uh, the, what we traditionally think of as the Senate and the House chambers. So while, yes, obviously, the building itself is of, of incredible uh, symbolic importance, I think that this feeling that they need to do the work no matter where they are uh, or, or what the circumstances are are, uh, is very important. So uh, to that
them, and, and they are starting to express that now. So uh, we're also starting to hear more questions about, you know, are the Republicans who uh, helped kick this off by saying they would object to this count still planning on doing that? And it's a little bit hard to get answers because everyone is separated uh, from their bosses. There is so much uh, confusion. Uh, but again, it does seem like this the plan here is to try uh, to go forward. I know there was a brief discussion about trying to evacuate senators from the location where they are using buses. Uh, that plan seems to be on hold uh, for the moment. Uh, one of our producers saw microphones going into the secure location where the senators are, as though they may be uh, setting up for something where they would be able to talk to reporters that uh, would involve. Uh, because again, remember, this debate is supposed to be public uh, as well, and that is uh, an incredibly important feature of the way our government works. And uh, I think that there is also a desire on the part of members of Congress to be seen carrying out their jobs, to, to demonstrate to the American people uh, that, that this is what they need to do. And uh, the other thing, Savannah, that I would just add, uh, we're asking for reaction to the president's video. Um, the problem with the president's video, uh, based on some of the people that I have spoken with, is that uh, he doesn't repudiate the basic reality uh, that that Joe Biden won the election. Instead, he gives additional credence to what these uh, protesters are here saying uh, has happened. And while he did say that they should leave the building, he did not in any way uh, condemn the the message of dis the, the, the disingenuous uh, false message that has prompted them to show up here in the first place. Yeah. So I think there's some concern uh, among members of Congress that what he did uh, doesn't help the situation as many of them has been, have been calling for, but instead will potentially make it worse. Savannah. That exactly, and that was the reaction, the fast reaction of Congressman Liz Cheney. That it, did, you know, it doesn't go far enough if you, on the one hand, say go home, but at the same time, you're you're pouring fuel on the flames by saying that you were robbed, it was stolen, uh, the the election was stolen, and that it was fraudulent. That is not what Rep many Republicans have asked the president to do at this moment of crisis in our country. They've asked him to be clear and unequivocal that it's time for the peaceful transition to a, a new president, as our Constitution and our democracy requires. Let me get to Ellison Barber. She's our correspondent. She's in Washington. I believe she's outside the Capitol. Yeah. Hi, Allison. Uh, Ellison, what have you been hearing? Hey, Savannah. Yeah, so we've been watching uh, just in the last little bit here as we've seen police uh, on this opposite side of the Capitol start to use more tear gas on the crowd that is gathered over there. Not tear gas, we believe it. It seems to be some sort of mace or pepper spray that they're using on the crowd there. We had been told that some of those protesters were possibly breaking windows, and that's what led to the use uh, of that pepper spray. You can see right over here, we're starting now to see Capitol Police gathering here. They seem to be huddling, discussing possibly getting ready uh, for something. But all evening, since we saw those barricades first come down as protesters rushed to the front of the Capitol, Capitol Police have largely uh, kind of stood back. They, they have, uh, we've seen them kind of waiting up on different parts of the steps there as the protesters uh, made their way up closer. You can see people standing on an armored vehicle here holding flags, the American flag upside down, a Trump 2020 flag just underneath it. About 10 minutes ago, we were up closer to those stairs and somebody came on a bullhorn, a protester, saying that President Trump says that we should go home. He wants you to go home. Other people in the crowd uh, pushed back on that person. And he said, I know, I know, I understand you want to be here, but he's saying that we should go home. Another person then got on top of that armored vehicle and started yelling at people through the bullhorn to come back. So for now, it seems like there is still a large group of people here uh, who do not have any plans to leave in the immediate uh, incoming, up, upcoming future. I mean, this group, it is not as big as it was a couple of hours ago, but there are still people on these steps who seem to have no plans to leave anytime soon. People that we have seen come out uh, claiming to have been inside the U.S. Capitol, they are greeted kind of as heroes by the crowd here when they come out and they talk about their experience inside. And we saw some people actually following, kind of uh, uh, tracking closely behind a few police in riot gear, calling them traitors for whatever happened inside the U.S. Capitol and berating them as they made their way across the front here. Savannah. Uh -oh. Ellison Barber, a correspondent on the ground there outside the Capitol. I want to go to a news conference underway now. Hey, Muriel Bowser, the mayor of Washington, D.C., who's called the 6 o'clock curfew the to the Capitol, so let's listen in. Uh, this afternoon, I announced a citywide curfew for the District of Columbia beginning at 6 p.m. this evening, going until 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. During the curfew, no one is allowed to be outside in public places 
other than essential workers, which includes credentialed media engaging in essential functions. As you can see from uh, video images, the unlawful behavior inside the United States Capitol building. I continue to urge all Washingtonians to stay home and stay calm. And if you see something, say something. But above all, stay home. The behavior that we are witnessing is shameful, unpatriotic, and above all, it is unlawful. Anyone who has engaged in these activities, continues to engage in these activities, will be held accountable. There will be law and order, and this behavior will not be tolerated. The Metropolitan Police Department has been deployed uh, to assist the United States Capitol Police in, a in restoring order to the Capitol, and our Chief of Police will lead the command to clear the Capitol building and establish a perimeter around the Capitol. I have requested both the Virginia State Police and the Maryland State Police to deploy officers, and they have engaged immediately to deploy officers to the Metropolitan De Police Department to help regain control of the United States Capitol. I have also invoked several days ago uh, a standing mutual aid agreement with the, our surrounding jurisdictions, and I want to thank them for deploying. Um, those jurisdictions include Arlington County, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, uh, as well as Baltimore City. Uh, we want to uh, thank them for sending their officers in, assisting us with public safety in the district, as well as the response to the United States Capitol building. Additionally, I want to acknowledge and thank uh, the New Jersey State Police, uh, who will also be assisting the Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, so with that, I want to turn to Chief Conti for a situational update. Uh, Secretary of the Army uh, will make comments, uh, and we will take brief questions. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, and thank you, Mayor Bowser. My name is Robert J. Conti III. I am the Chief of the Police of the Metropolitan Police Department here in Washington, D.C. As you are aware, demonstrators came to our city this morning to exercise their First Amendment rights and were largely concentrated in the area of the National Mall. Following the President's remarks, a large crowd began to march eastbound on Madison Avenue Northwest and Constitution Avenue Northwest. As the demonstrators approached the United States Capitol grounds, there was a noticeable change in their demeanor. They breached the fencing along the U.S. Capitol grounds and confronted police lines surrounding the building. MPD was requested by the, United States, by the United States Capitol Police to provide assistance with crowd management, and due to the violent behavior towards the police officers there and their intent on gaining access to the, to the Capitol, a riot was declared. It was clear that the crowd was intent on causing harm to our officers by deploying chemical irritants on police to force entry into the United States Capitol building. As you are aware, they were able to gain access to the Capitol building, and I conf can confirm that one civilian was reported to have sustained a gunshot wound inside of the Capitol. Details of the shooting are not immediately available, and the situation remains under investigation. The Metropolitan Police Department will be taking the lead on that investigation. MPD continues to provide personnel resources and assistance on the grounds of the U.S. Capitol and has requested the assistance of law enforcement partners through a previously in place mutual aid agreement. As you heard from the mayor, a 6 p.m. curfew has been put in place tonight and will be in effect until 6 a.m. tomorrow, January 7th. We are advising everyone everyone that is not engaged in essential activity to get off the streets and adhere to the curfew. If you are found to be in violation of the curfew, police will be required to take action. Again, I want to reiterate and make it clear, please abide by the curfew that the mayor has set in place or people will be subject to arrest. Lastly, I know that many of you are familiar with the Metropolitan Police Department. Understand that there is no better agency in the country to handle First Amendment events. They happen on a regular basis here in our city. However, today's events were not representation of peaceful protests. Today, what we witnessed was unlawful, riotous behavior. And people that come to our city engaged in unlawful behavior will be held accountable. 
we can take any questions after, that you may have after the secretary has a chance to speak. Thank you, Mayor Bowser, Chief Conti. Uh, at around 3 o'clock this afternoon, we mobilized the D.C. National Guard to 100 percent strength. We'll have 1,100 personnel that are convening to the armory as we speak to support Metro PD in reestablishing uh, the safety uh, and the confines of the U.S. Capitol. Uh, we'll also be working with other federal law enforcement entities that are going to be coming here to the Metropolitan Police Station to add additional support and capability as they uh, continue deliberate planning and looking at how a clearing operation will be conducted. Thank you. And how does this work? This phone? Okay. Okay. Evan? Yeah, hi, hi Mayor and, and Chief Conti. Uh, could you please speak to the confusion surrounding the deployment of the National Guard? We understand that the council put out a statement saying that originally the Department of Defense We've been listening to a news conference from the mayor of Washington, D.C., and several officials, including the head of the Metropolitan Police Department, and, and with their plans on how to get this under control. The National Guard uh, in D.C. has been activated, as we just learned. Um, the, the Metropolitan Police Chief was very clear that what had started as uh, lawful demonstrations quickly escalated as a group of protesters came close to the Capitol. He said that the violent behavior toward police unfolded, including the, the firing of the irritants, some kind of irritants toward police, which allowed them to breach the fence and the police line. And according to the chief of police, a riot was declared. He said, this town is very used to people coming and protesting and exercising their First Amendment rights. This was not that. This was a riot, according to Metropolitan Police. And we're learning a bit more now about the plans to get this under control. It involves National Guard, involves FBI, it involves the Metropolitan Police Department, it involves the Capitol Police. We've heard word of the Virginia National Guard uh, being called in or at least requested. We'll see if we start to see some of that personnel. Let me turn to Janet Napolitano for uh, purposes of the discussion here, former Homeland Security Secretary in the Obama administration. And Secretary Napolitano, um, first of all, just your thoughts. I mean, you aren't near Washington, I don't think, but or not in the Capitol, but uh, when you see these images and what has unfolded today, as a former Homeland Security official whose job was to protect the homeland, what do you think? Oh, it's a it's a it's a dark day for our country. And you know, when I was Secretary of Homeland Security, we did all kinds of scenario planning for attacks on the homeland. But uh, this is akin to an attack from inside the homeland on on the functions of our democracy, on our government. And like I said, it it is a dark day. I mean, when you see that the Senate and the House have to be evacuated, that the session has to be stopped, uh, it, it is an extraordinary moment. And I, of course, I don't want to ask for any inside information, but if you could help us as the former Homeland Security understand, you know, what kind of planning is underway for this kind of situation. Perhaps this couldn't be imagined where American citizens, our own people, would storm the Capitol and put in danger members of the United States Congress and their staffs. But uh, certainly an attack on the Capitol is something you would have had to, comp to contemplate in your past job. Certainly, and, and there there are uh, procedures in place uh, for what's called continuity of government to uh, secure the members of the House and the Senate um, uh, should there be an attack. These were procedures developed in the wake of the attacks of 